Well, we'll get started then. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all again. I'd like to convene the meeting of the Thursday, January 28th, 2021 COA meeting. And will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amos. Okay, you know, let's see what happens. Here. There you go. Joe Malene Bilatayo. Here. Kathy Krisha. Katrina Chikowski. Cheryl Forbes. Here. Bob Fraley. Here. Mike Hillis. Here. Lynn Larson. Here. Marty Martinez. Here. Anna Moore. Here. Gerard Morrison. Here. Kevin Taylor. Here. We do have a quorum. We have well, a quorum. Welcome again, everybody. Glad to see you. Um, this is a reminder we're once again conducting this meeting entirely virtually. Just a few reminders before we get started. Most staff and members are participating from their own locale and a few may be in the commission office. The Zoom link has been made available to the public. Regarding Zoom identification, we'd like to ask that everyone check their Zoom identification and make sure it contains your first and last name accurately so we're able to call on you appropriately and also so that we get all names accurately recorded in the record. If you need to update your name, click on the three dots in the window with your picture to bring up the rename option. As we did in October, we're using the webinar platform in Zoom as opposed to the meeting platform. When it's time to take up an item, we will need a moment to bring the appropriate attendees into the meeting room and make sure that they can see and hear the committee and we can see and hear them as well. Participants will need to turn on their camera and unmute. Regarding microphones, members of the committee, we're going to mute your microphones to eliminate any background noise that we may get in the way of others hearing what is being said by the speakers. We ask that when you do speak, you unmute yourself, but then please, once you are done speaking, go back to being unmuted. You may use your space bar to temporarily unmute yourself as long as the active window remains to be the Zoom window. Much like an intercom system, you just press the space bar while you're speaking and release it when you are done. Regarding commenting or asking questions, committee members, some of you may also be using the video audio functions and some of you will be using audio only. If you're using the video and wish to make a comment, please either physically raise your hand on camera or use the raise hand feature in Zoom, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you are unable to do either of these options, as a last resort, you can also send a message in the chat feature in order to signal that you have a question or comment. Several of us will be looking for those comments or questions in the chat and the raised hands, but please make sure we don't miss you if you do have something to say. And just as a reminder, there are many people on the screen. You probably have multiple screens as well, so we don't see you initially. We'll be scrolling back and forth uh, from screen to screen to be sure we do catch everybody. Because we are a public body and must conduct our business in the public forum, we ask that you do not use a chat feature to make substantive comments or have discussions on any items. Public attendees of this meeting cannot see the chat box, and those who view the video archive of this, me archive of this meeting uh, will not have access to any conversations in the chat. Regarding motions and roll call vote, when you make your motions, please state the motion in full so there is no question what the motion is. All votes will be conducted via roll call. Just before the vote, we will remind everyone to make sure you are unmuted so that we do not miss anyone's vote. If you are unable to respond via video or audio, you may make your vote known through the chat function. The secretary will have to read your name and your vote when she gets to that part of the roll call vote to make it an official part of the record and to make sure the public knows what the vote is. Because this can't be quite cumbersome, we want to leave that as a final option. Regarding public comment, if any member of the public wishes to comment on a specific item, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen during the item. You will be brought into the main meeting room at the appropriate time and asked to state your name and affiliation for the record. If you wish to speak on a specific item, please send a request through the chat feature in Zoom telling us which item you wish to speak to so we can make sure to call on you during the appropriate time or you can send your comments through the chat mode and we'll read those aloud. Please make sure we have your full name and affiliation and which item and number and name as well. There is also a time designated for general public comment at the end of the meeting. And finally, regarding recording, this meeting is being recorded. 
After the meeting ends, the archived audio and video will be available via the commissioners or commission's website. So with all that having been said, do any committee members have any questions about these protocols? Okay, seeing none, let's proceed to item two. Item two is the approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda for the January 2021 meeting? And please remember to unmute yourself when speaking. There's a motion by Co-Chair Moore. Is there a second? Second by Jamalin Bayatayo. We'll now do a roll call vote. And if you are in favor, please say aye. Opposed, say no. Secretary, will you please call the names? Cynthia Amos. Aye. Jomaline Bellatayo. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to item three. Item three is the approval of the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 2020 meeting? It would be appropriate for any committee member not in attendance at that meeting to abstain. I, I did see a motion by committee member uh, Martinez. Is there a second? Second by member Forbes. Any corrections or changes to the minutes? All right, will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Shomalin Bolatayo. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Gerard. You're muted. Aye. <laughs> and Kevin Taylor. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. All right. Item four. Item four, the co-chair and member report. Any members have anything you wish to report? Quiet few months, apparently. <laughs> All right. I don't, I, 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 maybe we're just too busy to actually think about what we have yeah. to report on, right? I think it's more like it. All righty. Okay, let's move on to item five then. Item five is the staff updates. Ms. Hickey, will you please begin? Sure. Um, we have some items, not, not a ton, but yeah, we've been extremely busy as well. Um, happy New Year, everybody. I can't believe it, it doesn't feel like New Year, but Happy New Year. Happy 2021. Um, yeah, so we have a few things to talk about. The, Of course, the big overarching thing, obviously, is that this is Terry's last official um, meeting as director. She is coming back in, in May to uh, provide a report for my revisit. So we'll see her again, but this is her last um, hurrah as, a, as the director. And uh, we're all very sad about that. But I know all of you at the end of this meeting, we're gonna um, say a few words for Terry. So um, that's that. Okay, so I wanted to also note that um, we, as we do every year at this time, we have, um, three COA positions or, or vacancies that will, will be officially vacant as of June 30th. And so the COA applications are out. Those um, spots are Bob's, Kevin's, um, and uh, Anna Moore's. And we know Anna is not eligible to, um, to apply again, unfortunately, um, but both Bob and J. Kevin Taylor are also allowed, are, are, they can uh, reapply should they wish to do so. But we have the applications out, they're on the website. If anybody um, has anybody that's interested in these positions. So wanted to mention that and uh, the, the commission actually makes the determination. They will do um, interviews in April of the finalists and then the commission will make the, dis the determination. So, and those positions don't start until July 1. Um, all right, and then um, we wanted to talk a little bit about a few things. Um, one, uh, for your calendars, the I was looking at the March meeting, and because it comes so closely on the heels of this meeting, um, we only need one day. So we are changing it so that it's only Tuesday, March 2nd. So if you want to go ahead and free up your calendars for March 1st, that's great. Here, it's back to you. Um, it will probably be a fairly short meeting, although I'm not sure about that yet, but um, I am on a site visit that day. We, you might recall we had to change that date because the California Council on Teacher Education was having their meeting 
um, on the COA day. And so we changed it. And I am now on a site visit on that on March 2nd. So you'll be in good hands with Aaron and Michelle and everybody else. So, um, but I wanted to make sure that you are able to uh, loosen up your calendars a little bit. Um, just want to mention that, you know, we have begun um, <laughs> strongly in uh, these site visits for the spring. Um, we're continuing to do them virtually. Um, we just finished up a big one yesterday, uh, uh, Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and we have a whole bunch more coming right down the pike. So um, you guys are going to be busy, um, you know, after, from the March meeting on. So um, we are working um, hard to try to figure out next year's visits. We, as like all of you, don't know whether they're going to be virtual or whether they're going to be in person. We're kind of asking everybody to stay tuned. Um, you know, right now we have no ability to travel and we don't want to put our teams at risk. And, you know, so we're just watching it day to day like everybody else, you know, what is the state of the, state of the situation. Um, but these virtual visits are, are, are doing, the, doing the job. Um, it's much nicer to be able to go to the institution and really get a sense of what's happening on the ground. But, you know, in a pinch, this is what you got to do. So, um, so that's what we're doing. Um, I think, Aaron, do you want to start by talking about program review and common standards and where we're all at on that? Because Aaron has been very, very busy. <laughs> Aaron. Sorry, I should have unmuted myself a little more quickly. Um, yeah, and so have the consultants, by the way. So let me, let me get to that. So we did have our last... Um, of 14 program review sessions last Friday. Um, so with that, I have one more tomorrow, but it's a single, it's a single reviewer um, group. Uh, I just couldn't get them scheduled any other time, so they get a one-on-one -on -one session, but still. We did 14 sessions. That allowed us to, um, that allowed us to review all 124 programs from the 34 institutions that are in the Violet cohort. Um, so that, that, and that went very successfully. And as I mentioned to the consultants earlier, um, we had a lot of um, support from, from the consultants during this this year. We did this obviously virtually. It was the first time um, doing this virtually. I was very nervous up front about that, as I'm sure we all have been as we've transferred you know, some of our major work to virtual um, settings. But it went amazingly well. I mean, just wonderfully well. So well that I may be thinking that this is a great way to do program review in the future. It allowed a lot more people to participate that might normally not have been able to. Um, it did require a lot more participation by consultants because when we put people in breakout rooms, I needed a lot of folks to be able to send to the breakout rooms. So the consultants on staff were fantastic about stepping up, volunteering multiple times to be there. Um, they came with their areas of expertise. So consultants that focus on special ed came when I had lots of special ed programs, consultants with areas in you know, reading programs or bilingual or, or that. So they came to support teams that were reading the very programs that they work with. Um, and, it, and it actually, it was, it was wonderful and it allowed the consultants also to kind of see the process. And they came away from the process with some really great suggestions um, for how maybe we might be able to do things a little bit different maybe even a little bit better in the future. So I just, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about how program review went this year. Uh, that said, we are ramping up now for those same institutions to submit their common standards uh, review evidence. That's due at the end of February, February 28th. Um, and we have already identified the um, team leads and common standards reviewers who will be reviewing uh, those common standards submissions. And we have <clears throat> a handful, I think about nine common standards review sessions set up to facilitate that. Um, so that's all going fantastically. Uh, the common standards review sessions are also all set up to be done virtually at this point. Um, and we will proceed uh, with doing things that way. And I expect it will go as well as things went for program review. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about our work at this point. It's a, it's a lot of coordination and during a really busy part of the year as well. So, um, you know, just a real thank you to all of our BR, BIR members who have stepped up um, as well as Aaron and all the staff. I mean, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, we're right on schedule, which is kind of 
strange for a COVID year, you know, nothing's, nothing's running as planned, but this worked really smoothly. So it's wonderful. Um, I wanted to mention, um, so the other thing Aaron's been doing is working with um, uh, others to assign all the, the teams, you know, that's a big job in terms of the teams for the site visits. So um, working on that and um, kind of filling holes where they come up, where we have family emergencies and things like that. So that takes time. Um, some of the other work that we've been doing, so you know the governor's budget has come out. Um, uh, Terry, I, she's disappeared from our school. Oh, there you are. I'm um, here. Terry, why don't you take over the governor's budget, CSED and CBEST, I think would be helpful. Definitely. Thank you, Cheryl. So the governor's budget was released on January 8th. And at this point in time, the commission's budget is fairly stable. There's a slight reduction in authority for spending having to do with our attorney general work. And that is based on the fact that over the last number of years, we hadn't used the full allocation that the government had given us. So we don't think there's any concern there. There's also an additional $125 million proposed in the commission's budget that would allow additional both classified and teacher residency grants. Now, before we get super excited, last year in January, there was $354 million proposed for the commission's budget and it all was gone by the time the budget was signed. So let's hope nothing like that happens this year. There's an extra $100 million for residency and we have not seen the enabling language yet, but it will be coming. And there's an extra $25 million for classified, which would allow more classified staff to earn credentials. And it would keep our grants unit quite, quite busy. Uh, and in addition, we have hired a couple of new staff members and they're related to the fact that we have some early childhood work going on. The state of California is a participant in a federal grant called the Professional Development Renewal Grant, affectionately known as the PDGR for, for Professional Development Grant Renewal. And this is a wide ranging grant that will do a lot of the work to implement the master plan that came out in December. And that's the reason we've moved Dr. Phyllis Jacobson from her former administrative role to a role focusing on early childhood. There's a second grant California has applied for in conjunction with the, some CSU campuses that's from some philanthropic organizations and we're waiting to hear about that grant. But as part of that early childhood work, the agency has hired two additional staff members, one in professional services and one in performance assessment development. So Deborah Keeler from down in the Southern California area and Cassandra Henderson from up here in the general Sacramento area have both joined. Deborah's working with Phyllis on these pilots for the early childhood education. There is a new ECE webpage. If you're interested in this topic, you should visit. And Cassandra Henderson has joined Amy Rising's group working on developing performance assessments. Amy's group was also able to hire an additional staff member back in the fall, Zoltan Sarda, who's working with performance assessments also. Um, another part of the, the state budget that's coming out is actually quite exciting. If you remember last year, we talked about the Cunningham bill related to CBEST and the cholera bill related to subject matter. And both of those bills were gonna allow a mix and match option between the examination and subtests of the tests that are required. Those bills did not go anywhere due to COVID. But this year, as part of the budget trailer bill, the Department of Finance is including those concepts in <clears throat> the legislation that accompanies the budget. The really cool part, if this all goes through and is there when the budget is signed, is that legislation takes effect July 1st of this year. Normally, legislation takes effect January 1st of 2022 for this legislative year. So if these, this language remains in the budget, the CBEST would be able to be satisfied by a grade of B or better in a mathematics course at a regionally accredited institution, a grade of B or better in a course that includes reading, kind of like almost all courses, and a B or better in a course that includes writing. And so we're really definitely looking at things like, you know, we know the CSUs have intensive writing courses in every major pretty much. And so a B or better in that course would satisfy that part of the CBEST. So there's a lot of people that as of July 1st may not have the problem that they have right now because our current year candidates were admitted into programs without CBEST, 
due to the executive order and due to the commission's flexibilities, and a lot were admitted without CSET. We hope that the language is gonna be so clear related to CBEST that only, there will not need to be any regulations. It will just take effect the day J July 1st gets here. On the CSET side, it would also allow coursework to satisfy the CSET subtest requirements. If a person had completed a course in the domain of the CSET subject matter requirement, that would satisfy that part of the requirement. That is gonna to have to be put through regulations because we have to be very specific. We have to define the process that would take place for this. So we would be doing regulations on that. We're definitely talking about doing emergency regulations, which could be put in place fairly quickly after the budget is signed. So the first time the emergency regulations could go to the commission would be in the August commission meeting because that would be after the budget is signed. Mike, go ahead, you have a question? Yeah, Terry, I was uh, contacted yesterday by um, AICCU regarding uh, AB 320 by Medina mm -hmm. um, that also has language in there about the CSET and, and basic skills. Um, is, that, is that something completely separate? Um, <laughs> it is separate, but it addresses the same issue. There's multiple ways to get things done legislatively. And this has happened before where something gets taken up by the legislature and moves through the legislative process where it has to be heard by either the Senate or the assembly first. It has to be passed. It has to go to the other house. It has to be passed. If there's a change, it goes back to the first house. The other way is the governor can put things into legislation also. And so this is a two ways to approach the same topic. If the governor's budget contains that language about CBEST and it is signed, it would make the Medina bill not needed. And that bill would kind of just disappear, therefore. That's happened in the past where some things have been in someone's bill and then it may be just enfolded into the governor's approach. But it is the same idea and the commission is very supportive of it. So we're, we'll be monitoring that. I know Cheryl and the staff will be reporting on that as we go through the year. We've not yet seen the exact language because um, the trailer bill comes out late January or in sometime into early February about what the exact language is. And so once we have that, we will be updating everyone. The commission meeting in February would be a good place to monitor because that, that, that will be all reported there. So Cheryl, I think that was CSET, CBES, new staff, early childhood and the commission budget. So I think that took care of my part. Okay, sounds good. Um, two other things I just wanted to mention, and I, I don't think we have, um, so Kara Mendoza, the other administrator in our group, um, she's been working with Karen Sacramento on the refresh of the California Standards for the Teaching Profession, CSTPs. Um, they're out right now for um, their first preliminary um, you know, vetting with the field. So you can go on um, through the PSDE news and, and respond to the survey. We're collecting information about, uh, you know, uh, this first draft. Um, so that work is continuing and that will be put in front of the commission over the course of the next few months. So if you're interested in that topic, you may want to um, be paying attention to that. Um, and the other thing that's happening um, and uh, one of our members, Cheryl Forbes, has been involved, is the bilingual um, authorization standards are also being refreshed right now. So there is an agenda item that's going to the commission in February with an update as to where we are with that process. Um, it contains some draft um, uh, language and also um, presents <clears throat> sort of a, as Terry calls it, a naughty issue, K-N-O-T-T-I, <laughs> not the other kind of naughty, issue uh, related to clinical practice related to bi the bilingual authorization because there are some tricky um, ed code language about um, parity with taking exams versus taking programs and how much clinical practice you can um, require. So the commission will be having that discussion in February as well. Terry, do you want to add anything to those two items? No, those are two really important um, pieces of work that have been going on last year through the pandemic. Those groups met during pandemic times, really not in person, unfortunately. The other work staff has been really focused on is the pupil personnel services and ed specialist transitions. Those are still in process. And so that's pretty much what we've been doing. 
Um, let's see. That's um, most of the items. We're at. We do have an item on COVID that we want to kind of dig a little deeper on later. Um, we've been spending a lot of time talking about what that all means for this current group of candidates. So we have an item on that we'd like to um, share with you. Um, and I think that is probably it at the moment. Um, do we have anything else, Erin, that I am missing? Okay. No, Cheryl, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think, you know, the only thing that's been tickling in the back of my brain was that I didn't mention all of the technical assistance and office hours that staff have also been doing. Good point. Um, and we're finding that to be really valuable, really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, you know, every other week, multiple and single subject office hours and every other week intern and also SPED and then induction office hours are every week. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of picking up on that trend, we did a common standards office hours last Friday for institutions that are preparing to, so just Violet cohort, institutions preparing to submit. Um, staff's going to do another set of office hours for common standards in early February. Um, and then hopefully we'll, we'll do the same as we get to the end of the spring and institutions in Indigo are thinking about their program review for next fall. So um, really trying to provide a lot of technical assistance um, to institutions right now. And it's been, I think it's been great. That's a really good point. We, um, you know, talk often about <clears throat> what, what are we learning from this situation in COVID and what kinds of things do we want to continue as we move forward, even outside of COVID? And these office hours have been really helpful because they, they're a dedicated period of time where you have that staff person that is, you know, the person assigned to that area and you can come on and ask them any questions and they can troubleshoot with you or try to figure things out as, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we can work with institutions and it's been very helpful. Um, and it also is a really good way of us to know what are the challenges out there so that we have that direct, you know, that we're hearing about placements. What are, what are the issues around, you know, that kind of thing. So it's been a really good touchstone for us as well as the institution. So, you know, we are definitely going to be thinking about how to continue that in the, in the next. Um, Committee year. member Martinez has his hand up. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge the, the work of the staff with all of these office hours. Um, I know for our each of our departments, it's really been supportive and something that they've taken advantage of as often as possible and really supported. I, I feel like it's just um, for our candidates, it's been very smooth process because of the work that's that's uh, CTC has been doing. And so I just want to say thank you because it, it has been really helpful. And uh, I know you have a small staff and it's one more thing, but it's it's been very productive and a great opportunity. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, a small but mighty staff. I mean, uh, yeah, people have been great. So wonderful. I think that's it for now um, of all the big topics. And we certainly can delve into more if I think of anything else. But any, any questions as we move on? That's all you've been doing? <laughs> um, they are an incredible staff, as you, as you all know. Um, it's, and the more I get to, to work with them, it just, it's incredible the amount of work that you do and that you cover uh, under challenging circumstances that we've had. It, you just rise above the challenges. It's just phenomenal. I don't know if you noticed in the chat that Terry put in there, 31 more site visits scheduled between now and June alone. Uh, and the workload has been astronomical and they've just performed it with great style and, and class and uh, efficiency. Um, and uh, Anna, we probably should mention too, Co-Chair Moore and I, we presented um, the annual report. I don't think we haven't seen you since then, have we? Yeah, we, we did Thank the annual you. report. Yes, you did. The... I apologize. Oh, no, no worries. No, about we... that. Yeah, yeah. Just very briefly, we re uh, presented the COA report to the uh, commission back in December. And uh, I thought the presentation went very smoothly. I think we addressed all the questions. I think it was very thorough. The staff had prepared us very well with a detailed report, so we were well equipped to, to uh, represent all of you um, in, in good standing and, and uh, I thought it went very smoothly. The questions seemed to be answered and I don't, maybe Commissioner Kung, you can speak on that and you were there, I believe, for that. Um, Commissioner Kung, I don't know if you're, you're muted. I don't know if you're intending to speak with us or, oh, okay, no worries. Okay, um, Anna, anything you wanna add about that um, presentation we did? No, I, it, it did go very well. I've done a few of these um, and this was 
Uh, I felt very succinct and really the report that was provided to us to um, with all the information in it was uh, perfect and timely and um, of course, the, pres the meeting started with um, about an hour of people sharing their feelings and um, gratefulness for all the work that Terry has done. So, um, and there was uh, quite a few tears in the meeting of, um, you know, just heartfelt um, appreciation for all Terry has done. So, uh, aside from that, um, yeah, it was a great, great report. Thank you. Um, for uh, PSD for providing us with all the information in that and the written work. Um, that's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. So, and we'll have an opportunity to once again, thank Terry at the end. So Terry, we, we don't see you, but you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> I told her she has to stay. That's right, okay. All righty, um, no, no other questions and no other comments. We'll move on to item number six. Item number six, the program approval recommendations. And this is for action. There is one institution with two programs for approval from Biola University, the preliminary multiple subject intern and the preliminary single subject intern. Joining us today is Dr. Carolyn Bishop, Director of Elementary Education to answer any questions about the proposed programs. Do we have any recusals on the item? Do we have them on the line? I'm just making sure they're on. Are they on, Aaron? I and, did see. Yes. I, well, I can't see. I brought Bob and Dr. Bishop in. Uh, oh, let me let me bring her back chat. in. Okay. They need help. I brought her back in. And then Bob too. Yeah. Bob and is Bob also is the staff person on this. Dr. Bishop, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, oh, great. Thank you. Great. Oh, wonderful. And I can see you. Oh, Thank excellent. You. All right. Um, so once again, any recu recusals from any of the COA members? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, with the institutional representative, Dr. Bishop, anything you'd like to say about the proposed program? Um, probably I'd love to say thank you for these opportunities to have programs like this, intern programs. The idea of preparing teachers in quality programs to be effective teachers while on the job is something I think we're going to see much more need for, particularly during the pandemic as teachers sometimes opt out of teaching remotely and in person. So I think it's no better time than right now to increase our intern population. So I appreciate the opportunity and I'm excited to, to hear what you all have to say. Oh, well, thank you. Um, any committee members have any questions for representatives from Biola for Dr. Bishop at this point? I don't see any, and, and Mr. Locks, I know you were, you were involved in the process at this point. Uh, any comments you wish to offer for us? Uh, not really. I just that uh, I too, as the intern consultant, am uh, happy to have uh, Biola join the, the intern programs and look forward to working with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Locks. Uh, if there are any questions or discussions, is there a motion to approve Biola University's programs? Motion by Member Larson. Is there a second? Second by Member Forbes. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos? Aye. Jomaline Bolatayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Paul Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? All right. Motion carries. Congratulations, Dr. Bishop. Thank you all very much for all that you do and to support our work in the field. We appreciate what you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. All right. Moving on to item seven. Item seven is a report of program status changes. This item is divided into two parts. Part one includes items for action by the COA, which include requests to withdraw, requests to reactivate inactive programs, and or request to add a new content area to an existing program. Part two provides information on programs that have transitioned to revised program standards and programs that have elected to change to inactive status. These items are for notification only and require no action by the COA. I will read through all of them. So part one, section A, B, and C. Section A, program withdrawals. Section A is for action. 
there are eight program response, pardon me, eight program sponsors withdrawing 12 programs. So what we're gonna ask you to do members is look through the list and see if there are any of them that you'll need to recuse yourself. What we'd like to do is vote at once on all the items that does not have anybody recusing, and then we'll go back and take up individually the ones that do have any recusals. So what we'll ask you to do is if you do have a recusal, just uh, let us know which ones and we'll make note of that. Uh, Member Hillis. Uh, Cal Lutheran. Cal Lutheran, all right. Are there any other members that have any recusals? Okay, let's, we'll save Cal Lutheran to the end. So what we'll do is we'll take all the others besides Cal Lutheran and I will read them in order here. California Baptist University, education specialist added authorization, early childhood, effective January 31st, 2021. California State University Fullerton, school nurse, special teaching authorization in health, effective January 28th, 2021. <laughs> California State Long, University Long Beach, Education Specialist Added Authorization, Autism Spectrum Disorders, effective February 1st, 2021, and Teacher Induction, also effective February 1st, 2021. Fresno Pacific University, Induction, Clear Education Specialist, effective January 30th, 2021. National University, Teacher Induction, effective January 28th, 2021, Education Specialist, Preliminary Language and Academic Development with Intern, effective January 28, 2021. Education Specialist, Preliminary Deaf and Hard of Hearing with Intern, effective January 28, 2021. Education Specialist, Added Authorization, Autism Spectrum Disorders, effective January 28, 2021. Ontario Montclair School District, Education Specialist Added Authorization, Autism Spectrum Disorders, effective January 28, 2021. Toro University, California, Clear Induction Education Specialist, effective January 29, 2021. So we're looking for a motion now to accept these programs with the exception of California Lutheran University. So is there a motion? I see a motion by Co-Chair Moore, second by Member Martinez. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Cynthia Almas. Aye. Joe Maline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Killis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Okay, motion carries, thank you. Uh, we will now go back to California Lutheran University. We had one recusal of member Hillis and they are, their a program is a specialist teaching, reading and literacy added authorization, effective January 28th, 2021. Is there a motion? Motion by member Palatayo, is there a second? Second by uh, Member Taylor. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amos. Aye. Joe Malin Balateo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Jared Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you. Um, member, I'm sorry, section B, program requesting reactivation. There are no requests for reactivation. Section C, adding a new content area. We have no institutions requesting to add a new content area to an existing program. Part two, sections D and E are for notification purposes only and no action is required. Section D, programs transitioning. There are no programs requesting to transition at this time. And section E, programs moving to inactive status, no request to move a program to active, inactive status at this time. All right, that brings us to item eight. Item eight is the initial program approval for new program sponsors. Do we have consultant Hart Boyd with us? Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I've been communicating with Hart. I think he's logged on with a different 
name and is not able to change his name. So I am trying to find him. The CCTC site visit. <laughs> there's a CTC site visit and there's a, a well, phone if that, number. If, that is, if that's his image, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Just one second. There we go. That's so funny. Looks like Julie uh, Warren is his. Yes, thank you. Yep. As, yeah, she's a staff member. It's one of our accounts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good so morning, Hart. Do we have you? Uh, yes. Great. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you. And do I, we so need anybody else on this one? We have the other two institutional representatives. Yep. Yep. They are joined already. I can see that. So um, let's see. Is it Jennifer Lowe? Can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. And Leanna Morgan? Yes. Great. Thank you. So Consultant Heart Board will present this action item. As you may recall, the commission granted San Benito County Office of Education. Uh, they received provisional approval by the commission at its August 2020 meeting. And the SBCOE now seeks approval from the COA to offer a teacher induction program. And with us today are San Benito County Office of Education representatives, Jennifer Logue, Deputy Superintendent, and Leanna Morgan, Director of Human Resources. Does anyone need to recuse themselves? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Board, will you please begin? Bart, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I just yeah. You are present. All right, great. <laughs> um, this item presents San Benito County Office of Education's responses to the teacher induction program standards for the committee's consideration and possible approval as we are in stage four of the initial institutional approval process. A team of two qualified reviewers collaborated on a review of San Benito's COE's responses and came to a consensus on a final finding of aligned for all program standards. As a reminder, in the previous stage, San Benito COE was granted provisional approval by the commission at its August 2020 meeting. Please note that provisional approval only authorizes an, in an institution to offer educator preparation programs, but it is the determination of the COA which decides whether or not a specific program is approved. You may find hyperlinks to the final submission and reviewer feedback on page three of this item. Again, joining us today are Jennifer Logue, Deputy Superintendent, and Leanna Morgan, Director of Human Resources. They will both be available to answer any programmatic questions you may have, and staff is available to answer any process questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. We now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment on the proposed program. All right. Um, I don't really don't have too many comments to make other than I just want to thank the commission for all of their work to review every, everything. I know that's quite a bit of work for everyone to do. Um, and we are very excited. This has taken us several years to put together a program. Um, we've looked at some various programs around our area. And we're, this is our first time that we're going to be able to offer a program in our county for our teachers. And so I know our districts are very excited about that. And so we just are ready to, to move on. So um, I'm here to answer any questions. And I have Leanna Morgan here with me as well. Um, both of us have participated in some of the other programs in other areas. And so that's part of the reason that Leanna is here with us as the HR director. Great, thank you, Ms. Love. Ms. Morgan, any comments you wish to make? Just want to extend a very uh, warm thank you to everyone for your consideration of our program. And uh, we're very excited to be able to bring in teacher induction to San Benito County. It would be a blessing so our teachers could work and practice and do their induction right where we're at and not have to travel. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, all right, opportunity for any committee members to ask any questions or make any comments. I don't see any at all. So then do we have a motion? And we'll just, I think at this point, we'll ask you to go ahead and state the motion. Um, and let's have uh, member Amos, would you like to go ahead and state your motion for the record? 
I move that the committee it, um, accept the report, the recommendation for um, accreditation. Oh, I lost my place in the agenda. Can you state it for me, Bob, and then I'll repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> put, put the pressure on me. Okay, so we're looking through here. Um, they're approved, asking for approval to offer a teacher induction program. So the That's motion would be to accept the staff report to uh, grant approval for the SBCOE to offer an induct teacher induction program. How does that sound? Okay, so that, what item is it? Item eight. So that I get there. Sure. You can just say ditto. Okay, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the motion by Member Ambos. Uh, second by our member Martinez. All right, uh, will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joe Maline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Precia. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right, motion uh, carries. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Morgan, Ms. Logue, and thank you so much for joining us. And also thank you, Mr. Boyd, for your work. Yes, thank you. And I do want to just extend a thanks to uh, Mr. Boyd because he's been very, very helpful throughout this process. So thank you. Great, thank you Thanks, all. Everyone. Okay, just a quick funny side note. I know it's not the time to do it for ditto. Okay, so there's a house in the neighborhood that had tons of Christmas decorations. I mean, went all over the top. And the house right next to it had the word ditto with an arrow pointed to that house. It's like, it was like perfect. All right, um, moving on. We're gonna move on to item nine. Uh. Item nine is a discussion of institutions not in compliance with accreditation timelines. Analyst Michelle Bernardo will present this action item. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Bernardo, will you please begin? So action, oh, sorry, item nine is a notification of institutions not in compliance with accreditation timelines. Um, for this item, we just wanted to recognize or identify for program review documentation, um, some institutions that were late or requested an, an extension um, that was granted. Uh, all submission, all documentation for these institutions that were are listed in this report um, have been submitted um, now. So, but we just wanted to identify those ones that did grant extension, uh, were granted extensions and were a few of them that were late with their submission of their documentation. Erin, did you have any other comments for, for I do, No, I do not, thank you. And and it's an information action item, so I don't think you have to take action. We mm -hmm. always have that on in case you do want to take action, in case there's an institution that's been on many, many times, <laughs> and there is none today. It's, um, they've yeah. all submitted. Yeah, so if it was an action item, we would have two recusals, but since it's not an action, then, then we don't need to have any recusals at this point. All right. Any questions? All right, we don't see any questions. Well, we're moving on to item 10, which is a 9.30 time certain. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Do we have the uh, representatives from Cal State Dominguez Hills? We do. Excellent. Okay, if we're ready to proceed, we'll move on to item 10 then. Item 10 is a report of the accreditation team to California State University Dominguez Hills. Consultant Aaron Sullivan will introduce the item. Joining her today is team lead, Dr. Judith Silva and institutional representatives, Dr. Lisa Hutton, interim dean, Dr. Kate Esponzito, Chair of Special Education, Dr. Pablo Ramirez, Chair of Teacher Education, and Jared Kawasaki, Assessment Coordinator. Does anyone need to recuse himself? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please begin? I will, and let me just first say, um, <laughs> actually, let me first say, Trying to do the bringing the panelists in and out and hosting this and also having an item is pretty uh, breathtaking. And again, Terry, you're amazing. Um, there's a couple of uh, individuals, um, uh, Jared, Dr. Kawasaki and Dr. Um, 
Esposito, I am not seeing them in the panelists. So um, Lisa or Pablo Ramirez, I'm sorry. If you see them, will you let me know and I will bring them in? Because I'm, I'm here. Think... Kate Esposito's here. You are. I'm just not seeing do uh, Dr. Okay. Ramirez. I apologize. So, okay. So thank you so much. Yes. So this is the site visit uh, report <clears throat> for the um, site visit to California State University, Dominguez Hills. Uh, we uh, had this site visit, was held in early October, October 11th through 14. Um, this obviously was a virtual site visit. It was not initially planned that way. I was, um, I had the pleasure of being able to do the year out pre-visit <clears throat> on the institution's campus, um, which was very nice. I was able to travel down there, see where they're located, um, have a tour, meet all of their wonderful faculty and program directors in person. Uh, and then, of course, beginning in March, we um, uh, did, did some backflips and, and the institution got themselves ready for a virtual site visit. Um, you know, these virtual site visits have been, um, they've had a, a little bit of a different look and feel depending on the institution and the size and the number of programs. And I just really want to give the institution kudos for um, preparing and, and handling logistics of this in a way that made it very, very easy for the team to access the meetings that they needed to access and have the support that they needed. Um, so in terms of just preparing us for a virtual site visit, um, they did a really, um, sorry, fantastic job of doing that. Um, also, as we, I think, are seeing with some of these virtual site visits, um, they experienced you know, having um, uh, candidates and completers and even some employers and administrators not um, showing up in the numbers that they had originally hoped for and did, again, a wonderful job of just all hands on deck, making phone calls and scheduling the additional um, interviews with those additional stakeholders that the team needed so the team could really speak to all the people that they needed to speak to. Um, enabled to, in order to come to um, their findings for this report. So um, just thank you to the institution and also thank you to a wonderful team. Um, and I, with that, we'll turn it over to the team lead, Dr. Judy Silva. Good morning. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to represent the team that visited Cal State Dominguez Hills in October, 2020. This was the first virtual visit, like Erin uh, said, for most of our members and myself included. Um, and the team at Dominguez Hills made it seem so easy, like this is what they always do. <laughs> so um, Dominguez Hills gets the highest commendations from our team for their organization of that site visit schedule, which was amazing. Um, the coordination of resources for the Zoom meeting rooms went very, very smoothly, what, 98% of the time? and their ever pleasant demeanor and responsiveness <laughs> to all of our requests for information and for access to stakeholders for interviews. So on behalf of our site visit team, which was also pretty, pretty powerful, um, I'd like to thank the, the faculty, the staff, the administration, the community partners, the candidates, the alumni, and their families, all of those people who participate in this visit because it was a lot to ask these participants to get on a call with us and tell us about their experiences at Dominguez Hills. In many ways, they each invited us into their homes and workplaces and their daily routines, sharing their bandwidth with their kids and their spouses and their roommates and their coworkers, all to get on a Zoom call with us. And we really, really appreciated it. It meant a lot that everyone pulled together and made that happen. Um, the College of Education at Dominguez Hills demonstrated an unwavering commitment to serving the needs of their communities in the Los Angeles South Bay area. The campus leadership that I got to talk to and the entire campus community at Dominguez Hills have placed social justice and equity at the centerpiece of their mission. And this focus was evident at the site visit based on the funded programs that were led by experienced senior faculty, the strategic planning for the college that's largely been led by faculty who are earlier in their careers at Dominguez Hills, and the commitment by all the staff and faculty and program leadership to pursue excellence through responsible fiscal management, 
leveraging technology to support their credential processes and all their processes and procedures, and using evidence to inform continuous improvement. Um, their passion for addressing inequities and serving the range of needs for all learners was clearly driving the curriculum, the field experiences, and even you know the stuff we didn't really look at, the options for advanced study <laughs> in the College of Ed there. Uh, candidates and completers talked about the value of the social justice and leadership emphasis relative to their own contributions to their communities of practice. And employers and community partners commented on the value of those partnerships and preparing educators who are ready to serve in their roles on day one. That being said, the College of Education is in transition. The site visit was led by Lisa Hutton, who is the associate dean, who also took on and wore the hat of the dean. Um, and she very successfully did this. She performed both of those roles at a level that was extremely impressive and not easy to pull off. And she pulled it off effortlessly. Like she didn't break a sweat at any point. <laughs> and it was still kind of warm in October. Um, let's see. So um, the, the faculty is changing, you know, all the CSUs went through a, a period where we weren't recruiting faculty or weren't able to hire and, and that is happening in a spectacular way um, at Dominguez Hills. Staff are changing and their roles are changing just as things are changing in the world. So it was pretty exciting. I also promised the former Dean, Dr. John Davis, I hope he's watching, that I would let everyone know that no birds were harmed in the site visit as one flew into the window of my home office while I was on a call with him. <laughs> the bird was stunned, I was stunned. <laughs> he was a little stunned at my stunned reaction, <laughs> but all is well. The bird is fine, the window's fine, and I think I have mostly recovered. So to get to what you probably really wanna hear about, the team's recommendation of accreditation with stipulations for uh, the College of Education at Cal State Dominguez Hills was based on a thorough and thoughtful review and, and much deliberation. Here, I really want to acknowledge the support from our consultant, Aaron Sullivan. Aaron really assisted the team in exploring the options to address the concern in the teacher induction program. The team found that the program standards were met for all the educator preparation programs with the exception of the one program standard, standard four, that was met with concerns in the teacher induction program. All of the common standards were met. To expand briefly on the concerns for program standard four in the teacher induction program, it became evident in interviews with candidates, completers, and mentors, and our review of documents, including the mentor agreement document, that the mentors were not receiving the training and support to fulfill their roles. The stipulation recommended by the team explicitly addresses this missing component of program standard four. So if you have any questions, I will turn it on over. Great, thank you, Dr. Silva. Uh, thank you for the thorough report and we are glad that the bird is okay. Although it sounds like your dogs might have other ideas. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, we now want to invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you this is not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you had about the visit itself. This is Lisa Hutton, the interim dean, and I just want to thank both Aaron and Judy and the team. I thought it was a very, um, it was a good visit. The whole process, I think, helped us to really look at our programs and reflect on them and make some changes along the way in the two years preceding the visit. Um, and though like all of us, it's been a bit of a crazy year, I thought the visit went well. I thought the findings were very fair. Um, and I did wanna comment that we already have put for that one standard in teacher induction, I felt that it was a fair assessment. It was a fairly new program that combined special ed and general education um, teacher induction program. Um, and we do already have a plan in place. We've already begun to implement some of those changes. And Dr. Esposito, um, who is the chair of special education is working uh, very closely with the coordinator of the teacher induction program. So I was gonna have her 
comment on just a couple of those changes that have already are happening or we have a plan. Thank you, Dr. Hutton. Dr. Esposito? Thank you. Um, I also want to second what Dr. Hutton said. Um, the visit really was um, very fair and really informative and has allowed us to reflect upon our practice. Uh, we have uh, some of the, in regards to standard four, we have made a couple of changes. We have scheduled monthly meetings with our, um, our mentors, um, and those are led by our clinical uh, coordinator, Dr. Pat Marisic. Those are about an hour and a half long, and with, embedded within those meetings is just-in-time training. Uh, the topics around um, those trainings are taken straight from the standards. So the first meeting will be held next month, and that meeting will focus on adult learning theory. Um, and so we've really tried to go back in, really look at the standards, really look at best practices, look at the populations that we're serving, and, and really do our best to ensure that we're providing the support. Uh, the other uh, comment surrounded um, how we provide the mentor logs to our support providers. And we have them uploaded onto our website. Because the, the support providers are not um, university employees, we aren't, we're, we're really working on a solution to identify a way to pass, password protect them. But be, so that is really where we're at right now. We have all of the documents uploaded. We have uh, methods for those instruments to be returned to the clinical support. Uh, coordinator, as well as for the candidates to upload them. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Esposito. Thank you. Um, any other representatives of the institution wish to offer any comments? Um, I, I would like if he, if there's just another minute or two, our new assessment coordinator, um, Jared Kawasaki, Dr. Kawasaki, um, one of the inconsistencies in the common standards was about our data collection. And I think, you know, we put such an intense uh, system in place after our last accreditation visit six or seven years ago that I think we actually went overboard and we were collecting so much data that sometimes uh, trying to get through all that data was actually impeding our ability to to look at <laughs> what was important about our programs. And so, you know, we've actually have done a major reorganization, which I am thrilled about. And I don't know if uh, Dr. Kawasaki could comment for just a moment. Sure, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, everybody. To echo, again, what Lisa and Kate said, uh, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Judy. The entire team was really, I, I appreciated their thoughtfulness in their questions. Uh, they were they're really great listeners. and. Um, it was my first accreditation visit, so it was actually a, a really great experience um, uh, that followed 18 months of a lot of scrambling. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of the assessment, the only thing that I really wanted to add was um, being part of the accreditation process helped me to realize how important it was or is to embed accreditation as a part of our reflective process. Um, and moving forward, I think, and I think oftentimes accreditation becomes this 18 or nine, 18 month scramble uh, to make sure that we have everything done. But uh, given um, the, the in, incredible review that we got, and thank you again to the team, uh, it, it gives us some time to really think about how we might embed accreditation as a part of our reflective process. Um, and that's really, and I'm a part of a, a CSU consortium of a bunch of data people who are really trying to thoughtfully think about this. Um, and so it's really exciting. Uh, we, we have kind of like jumbled and remixed and kind of uh, twisted things to helpfully, uh, with the main aim of making things more meaningful and more useful for us. Um, as Lisa had mentioned, we were collecting so much data that it become, became overwhelming um, in terms of data collection, data organization, data analysis, and then overwhelming for the faculty to look at so many things so often every single semester. Um, and so we're really kind of taking the approach of like, what are the most meaningful outcomes for us? Um, how do we meaningfully in, uh, assess them and then use that information uh, to be able to make to do program improvement, which is exactly what we're accreditation is asking us to do. So um, those are, and I, I can, we have many examples and lots of work that's been happening uh, in each of the divisions and as a unit as well. So 
Um, and I should say, I got here in fall of 19. So uh, it's been kind of put on my shoulders to really take the reins of this and really kind of like think thoughtfully about how we might do assessment. Uh, what's the next step? What's the evolution of our assessment system? Kind of taking the accreditation feedback, using a lot of the critical evaluation and assessment research that's out there and the needs of our students and our uh, faculty. So I could take any questions if there are any questions about that. It's very vague, very general, um, but that's kind of the, the, our thought process right now at least. Thank you, Dr. Kawasaki. Um, yeah, you mentioned about having the overwhelming da data in Dr. Hutton, you mentioned that as well. Sometimes I totally get that. We look so much at the detail information. It's often, we forget to step back and see what is the most important, what would be most valuable for the process and for the program overall. So as a, a very astute uh, comment, I totally agree with that. Um, I also like the fact that you mentioned that accreditation um, and the assessment is part of the reflection process itself, that it's just not a standalone, then you put it in the drawer and come back to it six or seven years later. Um, and that's good to hear. We, we really appreciate those comments. That's something that we know all institutions strive for. And it's nice to hear that you're taken very seriously uh, at the CSUDH. Um, any uh, committee member wish to offer any comment or have any questions? I saw a hand and it disappeared. Oh, Mar Member Martinez. I had a question. Um, it really related to evaluation and mentors. Um, how will you receive evaluation data or feedback from your mentors to know that you're, that you're meeting their needs going forward? And also, uh, you mentioned that they're outside of, they're not Dominguez Hills employees. So where do your mentors come from? I, I think I can take that. Um, so we have the, it's a very small class um, that they take each semester, the teacher induction program. So the faculty member who is overseeing the course is kind of the super mentor. But then each person has a site-based mentor who is at their school site. And because they are not students at Dominguez and they're not, they're not employees of Dominguez, um, that has you know, been a little bit harder to manage. And that's what we've been grappling with. Um, but we do have, um, so there is an evaluation process both by the uh, teacher induction students there's a survey that they fill out about their mentors and then kind of the super mentor, um, you know, is really checking to make sure that um, the mentors are uh, giving really authentic feedback on their, on their work. So it's kind of a two, uh, two different ways that we're getting feedback. Can you clarify how you receive feedback from the actual site mentors themselves? Those are in, I assume they're K-12 employees. Yes. So uh, it, right now, it, um, yeah, a lot of the folks are in, uh, are in charter schools or we have a lot of special education that don't have a district mentoring program. Um, so the mentors themselves are also there. I, I, I would have to check with the induction corner, coordinator or Kate might know, but I believe that part of the process is that they fill out an evaluation every semester as well about their experiences. Um, they, they work on their plan. And so they're evaluating them and the, and typically when the candidate applies for the induction program, the principal signs off on the mentor. So the mentor has been vetted through the district and then through the, um, the mentoring forms, that's how we receive feedback. And then through these monthly meetings, we'll also receive feedback from the mentor. So if there is, um, if a candidate is struggling um, with one of the CSTPs, then we can quickly um, provide some training either to the candidate or even to the mentor to address that. Does, does that answer your question? It does. And, and um, you know, just because with the, with the teacher induction standards, the mentor is really the key and um, really the primary um, kind of, I, I'm not sure, I guess the driver of the teacher's experience uh, on the, of the induction candidate's experience. And so I just wanted to hear that there's a comprehensive program to really train those mentors so that um, beyond the super mentor for those who are, you know, in the field working, um, I, I, you know, for that average of one hour per week with their teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to hear more about, about <laughs> that they were getting that training and really understanding you know, developing their skills around mentoring. 
I might just add too that you know we really have close contacts with the districts and so since they're recommending the mentors we also have that networking opportunity and and so it, it we it, it is an ongoing process but yes we are attending to that thank you co-chair Moore um, first, congratulations on a successful visit. Uh, Sounded like it was really helpful for everyone and that it was fun. Um, I'd like to hop in through my computer and over to those uh, palm trees back there. Everybody looks like they're in sunshine. Sounds lovely. Um, I had a couple of questions. Also, uh, the number of interviews, that was fantastic. I know that, um, that uh, Judith mentioned uh, how well it was put together and uh, it was looks extraordinary and I'm glad it went really well. Anyways, my question, um, page 24, um, it mentions that candidates research and find their own field placements that are then approved by the program. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, it, in, is there a timeline? What are the qualifications for these sites? Is there a list that they go to and they reach out to people? Or uh, does the mentor program work to suitably pair them up? Are you speaking about specifically the teacher induction or a different program? Did you say page 24, Anna? Yeah, you're mute. Okay. I yeah, think I just that is the PPS school council. Right. Program. Child welfare. Yes. Sorry. Yes. You know, I didn't, um, I didn't, the count, our person that is Dr. Uh, Mancias isn't, isn't on the call. Um, I know that PPS is, it's a very small program. Um, and it is, and it's an MS program as well in either school or college counseling. And so um, I know that oftentimes uh, there, there is a procedure for okaying those placements, um, but they work with local school districts for the PPS. Um, and then there's a whole format for approving the site mentor. Um, I think it's just a little bit different by the nature of the, um, of the program itself, as opposed to like a student teaching, you know, where we do all of the placements. Definitely the coordinators work closely to make sure that those mentors, they, they work with a lot of alums as well. We have a lot of alumni um, that are the counselors that take on um, the you know, the clinical pieces for the PPS program. I think I'd have to just go back and, and you know, I don't have a, a, a really stellar knowledge of every piece of every program. So I have to depend on those coordinators and chairs. Um, and that was actually a great answer. That was, that was, you answered my question perfectly. Thank you so much. Um, and the other question I had was, um, I think Dr. Esposito was, touching on this, but I, if you could just clarify, on page 36, it, it does say that evidence suggests candidates are currently being made responsible for ensuring mentors receive the training and support materials they need from the program and are responsible for uploading the mentoring logs to TaskStream. You talked about it being password protected. Um, I'm just still a little uh, unclear yeah. about the candidates being made responsible for ensuring mentors receive training and support materials. And so I think that that statement is what we went back and are addressing. So now we have, um, when there's the initial training of the mentors, we have already have our four, at least for this semester, our monthly meetings that we're gonna meet. Um, and then the mentors will be able to pull down the materials. They'll be stored on our, on our website. With regards to submitting them, each of our, it's part of our data collection, and I, I think that um, Jared could speak a little more to this, but as candidates, each of our candidates is provided with a TaskStream account, and so they in turn then enter some of that data because we wouldn't have um, someone who's not 
a university employee have access to a student account. So students can upload some of that. But the other forms and the other mentor forms, those are now, there's a more formalized process for submitting them to um, our clinical coordinator over induction. So I think that is the area that we're trying to address. And when I mentioned password protection, it's because as district employees, we don't have a mechanism right now on our website that would provide someone who's not an employee of the university with any type of password that would enable them to, to access. So we are exploring Box as a potential option. And it is something that we're working on. Uh, but for right now, they're going to just be stored on our website, accessible to anyone. So I just, wanted, I just wanted to clarify that, that, um, so yeah, the, the, just the blank forms and stuff, right, are accessible to anybody, but right now the mentors are having to submit things to the super mentors or the clinical coordinators, but um, we've been working with IT. Um, we can't get certain things like our learning management system, like Blackboard, um, they, we can't get access for them to um, upload through that system. So we're exploring, we have Dropbox as a university, and, but there's a password protected feature where folks can upload into Dropbox um, and it goes to a secure site so that they don't have to send any secure information. They don't have access to see what's been uploaded at that point. So it, it's just been a little bit, trying to explore all those technical aspects of how to make this happen. Whereas I think when a, ment a, a teacher induction program is set within a district, they're all district employees. And so that's a little simpler. Whereas we may have, you know, folks from 10, 15 different districts or even more or charter schools. So sometimes that's, that, that's kind of the piece that we're trying to put in place and we have been meeting with IT. So we're working on that plan. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I've been there, done that, <laughs> just to, to streamline that process with all the documents and still take the onus off the student teachers um, and put it onto the mentors. Um, and then you have the monthly meetings that you were talking about, which sounds like um, it's a great opportunity for the mentors to collaborate and discuss um, the things that are going well, as well as their challenges. Is there training that's occurring? I know uh, Dr. Martinez was trying to touch base on that with regards to exactly what is the plan for that mentor training? Uh, is that in process or do you have a, a plan laid out for this, uh, for this coming spring and next fall? Yeah, so there's already in place the, the, these four trainings that Dr. Esposito, but we already have in place and what was happening earlier was that um, the coordinator and the instructors do like weekly Zooms uh, with the, um, at this point it's all virtual, with the candidates and the mentors are also invited to those Zooms. And a lot of that is just in time PD or a topic that they wanna discuss. Um, so that training is also more informal, like the, the candidate and the mentor getting on um, a, a Zoom. And sometimes it's topical or sometimes it's requested depending on their goals. So that was already in place before the visit. And now we're adding these more official um, trainings. And we have, uh, you know, found some funding, not a lot, but to, to pay the mentors to attend these trainings, um, which we're at this point, we're doing for this semester. And we hope to even beef that up for the fall. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Member Hillis. Yeah, I just had a, a quick question on uh, table one, which uh, starts on page eight. Um, I'm curious where it talks about the number of program completers and then the number of candidates enrolled, um, the significant increase in enrolled. I'm, I'm curious, is that simply a product of increased enrollment or is that an issue of uh, retention? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Uh, I, I'm just curious, um, 
because obviously a number of program completers would um, <clears throat> be the people that actually go through uh, the entire program, but we don't know what the initial enrollment number is. Um, and I'm curious if the, the number of initial enrolled um, for that completer program is comparable to the number of enrolled in 2021, or if you've just seen a significant increase in overall enrollment this year, like I know a lot of programs have experienced. I think we, we've seen a significant enrollment bump. Um, because this was a new program, this teacher induction program, this combined one, um, I think it's been growing. And I believe we have about 60 um, that are enrolled right now. Sometimes the numbers, we do have a lot of university interns um, that are come out of special ed. And so a lot of them are only with us for a year um, and do exercise and apply for that early completion option. Um, so that sometimes the numbers can be a little bit in flux because some people are there for one year, they do early completion, and then others are there for the full two years. Um, but I, again, right now we have about 60, which is definitely a jump from what we had um, even a year ago. Great, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from any of the committee members? Member Balatanya. Hi, um, I was just looking at your, um, at page 11, um, and it's under um, preliminary multiple and single subject. Um, I appreciate this, um, this, this new modification you guys have made in your program. Um, can you tell me more about your um, funds of knowledge projects? It's, it sounds really interesting. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. I'll take it, thank you, Dr. Hutton. Good morning, everyone. I am the, the chair of teacher education. Um, and funds of knowledge, you know, drawing from Mold's work is embedded in particularly each phase of our program. Um, and our program is divided up into three phases. Phase one is the ideological one. Phase two is the more of connecting theory to practice. And phase three is sort of bringing everything together and what we try to do is to bring the funds of knowledge work up to current um, conceptualization. So we're trying hard to link theory into instructional practices so that students understand what it means when we talk about students, cultural assets, cultural um, capital, how we use that in lesson plan development, in particular with the Hispanic Servant Institute, which serves you know, a large percentage of historically um, Latino populations, but we also engage other students to understand funds of knowledge so that they can present their work with all students. And we're, we are working hard to go beyond theory so that students can actually design, develop lesson plans. And this is nothing new, but to link theory, instructional practices, um, across each phase so that by the time that they get to the final semester, they could come together and know theoretically that understanding, but link it, link it to a purposeful lesson, thematic unit or, or curricula that impacts students. Um, and it's a work in progress. As you know, funds of knowledge um, mm -hmm. could be seen in, in a different light. At Dominguez Hills in teacher education, we really try to link that to instructional practices as best as possible. And we do also have, um, you know, we work with our faculty as well to, to have current data and current information about um, conceptualizing and understanding funds of knowledge. So it goes both ways, working with faculty to sort of deconstruct and then bringing it back to the classrooms um, and helping folks understand how to link it to classrooms. But we're excited, it's, it's exciting, but it's now um, going away from theory into instructional practices. Thank you so much. Um, I work as, uh, aside from teaching, I also am the ELD instructional coordinator at our school. And this is something that I really find really super um, informative and merging theory and practice is, as we all know, um, not an easy task. Um, and merging that with culturally um, and linguistically responsive 
um, pedagogy is also an everyday challenge. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, I don't see any. Is there a motion to accept the uh, team recommendation from any of the committee members? Uh, Member Taylor, would you please state the motion? Yes, uh, uh, I move that uh, the committee accept the recommendation um, uh, for uh, accreditation for CSU Dominguez Hills. All right, thank you. And is there a second? Is the is the recommendation accreditation with stipulations? I believe. All right. Thank you, Mama okay. Martinez. Okay, thank you. So it's to accept the team report. Of Aaron, did you, did you need to clarify anything? The accreditation. The the recommendation. Yes, I'm sorry. I was just confused for a moment. It, yes, it's with stipulate. It, pardon me, Cheryl. You're on mute. Sorry, I just noticed you wanting to say something. You were the staff person, so I wanted to make sure you got it in. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's to accept the team recommendation of accreditation with stipulation. And there was a second. I saw a few hands. A second by Member Martinez. Any further discussion? Secretary, would you please call the roll? Cynthia Almo? Aye. Jomelaine Bilatayo? Aye. Kathy Gracia? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Cheryl Forbes, Bob Fraley, aye. Mike Hillis, aye. Lynn Larson, aye. Marty Martinez, aye. Anna Moore, aye. Gerard Morrison, aye. Kevin Taylor, aye. Thank you. Motion carries. So congratulations to all the team for all your work and all your effort. I want to thank you, Dr. Sutton, Dr. Esposito, Dr. Ramirez. Dr. Kawasaki, thank you, Dr. Silva as well, and also Ms. Sullivan. Thank you all for your uh, in-depth and, and wonderful presentation. Thank you, committee members, for the wonderful questions. Thank you all. Have a great day. Looking at our schedule, we are a little bit behind schedule. I know that uh, Member Martinez needs to leave at this point. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We do hope that all is well with your family, that everything is okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. So long. Um, we still do have a quorum. We were trying to work a break in, but it looks like at this point we are now about 15 minutes behind. So if we can, let's move on to the 945 time certain, which is item 11. And we would like to work a break at some point uh, for a few minutes during the morning session. But I know the other team has been sitting here waiting to go. So we'll move on to item 11. Item 11 is a report of the accreditation team, the Chula Vista Elementary School District. Consultant Karen Sacramento will introduce the item. Joining her today is team lead Sean McCarthy and institutional representatives, Dr. Francisco Escobedo, superintendent, Dr. Gloria Sorisa, assistant superintendent of instructional services, and Brittany Mabe, coordinator, instructional services. Brittany, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir, you did, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, does anyone need to recuse himself? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Sacramento, will you please begin? Yes, I will. Good morning, COI members. As the state consultant to this visit, it is my pleasure to share the report from the Chula Vista Elementary School District Teacher Induction Program site visit, which was held on October 12th uh, to 14th as a virtual site visit. The protocols for this visit were all in accordance with normal procedures for, for a site visit uh, and took into consideration additional support for the online format, which made it go very smoothly. So thank you to the district representatives for all the work that was done in this regard and for being so proactive and positive to work with all along the way. The findings were based on a thorough review of all institutional and program documents, as well as a wide range of stakeholder interviews. I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous program leadership uh, team of, of Brittany Mabe, uh, Rochelle Carroll, Dr. Gloria Sarisa, under the district leadership of Dr. Escobedo. And I would also like to share recognition for this program that is fully dedicated to serving and supporting induction candidates by providing a high quality standards-based mentoring system 
for new teachers on every level. I would also like to acknowledge the extremely hard work and continual professionalism before the visit and throughout the visit of the site visit team members, Beth Latrell and Christina Petricioni and the tremendous leadership of Sean McCarthy as the team lead. His effort, like, effortless guidance for the visit just continued to focus on the standards and preconditions as well as created a strong and enjoyable visit for all. So I will turn it over to Sean now to review the program findings. Thank you, Karen. And uh, thank you everybody for letting me share a little bit about our visit. I uh, also would like to take a moment to thank my team, Beth and Christina, just did an outstanding job preparing for the visit, which just you know made everything so much easier. And throughout the entire process demonstrated an incredible commitment to induction and teacher preparation. So, you know, they just did so much of the heavy lifting for me. And of course, I want to thank Karen, her just steady grounding guidance. Uh, I just can't say enough about how much I appreciate her leadership throughout this entire process. And also uh, just thank you, Brittany and the Chula Vista induction program and their leadership, the preparation in advance. Of course, this was a virtual visit and it could not have gone more smoothly. They were so well organized, responsive to questions that we had ahead of time throughout providing additional resources and just did such a great job making sure that all their stakeholders were present so that we really had uh, a, you know, such an easy time uh, connecting with all their stakeholders, getting through those virtual interviews. We just didn't have to worry about a thing. We just, you know, conducted those interviews, gathered the information that we needed. So a very, very smooth process. And I just, you know, would like to highlight some things, you know, in particular, the in particular, that were really special about this program. You'll see in the report, you know, how well designed we found their program to be with the highly individualized support, uh, skilled mentors who were really well trained, strong mentor candidate relationships, uh, all the ways they're constantly evolving through the use of data to improve their program. You know, all the, the call marks that we're looking for in a really strong induction program. And you're gonna read that, you're gonna see the you know fantastic quotes that we gathered from the various stakeholders. So just a very solid program design as they work their way toward ensuring their you know programs are Grow, uh, their candidates are growing toward competence. So all those things that we wanted to ensure were there were clearly there. But something that really stood out for us with this program was how well integrated they were with the district and site initiatives for professional learning, particularly those that focused on equity, diversity, and implicit bias. And at every level there was just really strong evidence of collaborative relationships that were focused on moving everybody in that same positive direction from the superintendent all the way down through the candidates and it, it was just really impressive and it was just clear that their leadership was connected and was doing really special things with this induction program. And we just kept coming back from meeting with stakeholders and, you know, we'd have our debriefings and we're just kind of wowed by what they were doing. So based on our review of evidence prior to and during the visit, our team recommends full accreditation for the Chula Vista induction program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. And this is now an opportunity for the institutional re representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you this is not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you may have about the visit itself. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I really want to thank the full site visit team and Karen Sacramento, the commission overall for your support through this process, as well as Dr. Escobedo and Dr. Sarisa. Um, I'm so fortunate to serve alongside an amazing team. 
In Chula Vista, we're always striving to create a better system that supports our kids and our community and continuous improvement is the process that we're committed to. And we really found that the accreditation efforts and process supported us in achieving this. And so through the last few years, we've been able to enhance our program to better support the needs of our teachers. We've been really intentional to keep our vision and mission at the forefront and let the program standards really drive our work. Um, one of the ways we've done that is we've made sure to bring alongside our stakeholders in the process of understanding what the standards say and really going back and consistently looking at them, analyzing them, looking at our practice in, lighting, in light of them and improving our program overall. So we're really looking forward to continuing to serve our teachers, especially in this new season of um, distance learning and in the world of education that we're finding ourselves in. Um, we want to continue to equip our teachers to provide strong experiences for each kid. In Chula Vista, we believe that each child is an individual of great worth. And so again, we thank you, we thank the team, and um, I'd love for Dr. Stresa to share a little bit more. Thank you for that, Brittany. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Brittany, for that. I just um, wanted to take a moment to thank the team, Karen and Sean and Beth and Christina. What an incredible experience this has been for us over the past couple of years and going through this journey. I just, I think what I would like to say about the process that you've established for the accreditation really has um, allowed us as a district to, to go through the process reflectively and in the process itself mirrored our culture of collaboration and interdependence with each other. And I think Sean, you, you mentioned that as a highlight, but the process allowed us to be truly um, interdependent with who we were working with. It forced us to sort of look at our program through a lens of equity and hear from our stakeholders and learn from our stakeholders about what areas of improvement we needed to make or what we needed to be thinking about in support of our new candidate. So just wanted to thank the committee itself for the process in, um, in, in allowing us to, to really look clearly on, on our program uh, through a lens of, of what you mentioned, that equity lens for us is really, really important. And we wanted to make sure that our program was not just aligned to the standards, but truly inclusive and being responsive to the needs of our candidates. And building that capacity for our mentors was um, something that, that we are continuing to work on and continuing to, to grow in. So just thank you for the, for the committee's work and, and for working with us and, and collaborating with us. And we're very, very proud of, of our program. And of course, Brittany does such a great job in, uh, in, in making sure that, that the process was, was on point. So thank you so much for that. And um, we look forward to the approval. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, you both touched on the fact of the comedy that standards are driving the work for program improvement and for inclusivity uh, in support of your teachers and students. So we're very glad to hear that that is really part of the process there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, any questions or comments from committee members? All right. Seeing none, this is an action. Yeah, I see two. I think Jane yeah. Kevin Taylor and oh, I see a hand up from member Larson. Hi, just one question. Um, on page 18 of the report, it states that mentor training varies based on the data trends from prior year student achievement and survey input. And so I'm just wondering, um, how do you determine what changes need to be made in mentor training and maybe give an example? Absolutely, that's a great question. So we have a variety of ways that we're collecting data consistently through the year. Of course, we're looking at completer data from the previous year, but during the year, we survey our year one candidates separately from our year two, and we also survey our mentors. And so we use those surveys, number one, as one item that we're collecting and analyzing. Um, but additionally, we've started offering back in, I wanna say the spring of 2019, we started offering monthly virtual chats for our mentors, and we've had really strong attendance in those. And through those, we offer like a really short coaching session for mentors and then the opportunity for them to share questions, concerns that are coming up so that we can use those comments to drive future work. Um, additionally, one other example that we've used 
within the last uh, two years is we implemented a really strong progress tracking um, process for all of our candidates and the work that they're doing on their ILPs. And so their ILPs are reviewed quarterly and then feedback is provided to both the mentor and the candidate on the ILP so that we can be right in alignment with the work that the teacher is doing and the support they're receiving from the mentor and meet the needs and right away take it to the next mentor training. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you both. Any other committee member have any comment or question? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion? Uh, member Balatayo. So I move that we accept the report and the recommendation of accreditation. Okay, is there a second? Second by Co-Chair Moore. Any further discussion? Vice Secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Amos. Aye. Joe Malene Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Escobedo, Dr. Sarisa, Ms. Maid, and Mr. McCarthy, and Ms. Sacramento. Thank you so much. Go and enjoy your day. Thank you. Um, committee, looking at our time, we do have a 10 o'clock time certain item 12. I'm going to propose that we do item 12 now. And if we do, I'd like to maybe do a brief break before item 13, which is a 10.30 time certain. That'll put us maybe a few minutes behind, but I think it would be good to get up and stretch. So um, again, I'll propose we'll do item 12 uh, and then a brief break. Erin, is there any way of notifying um, the team from Redwood City that might be just a few minutes late? Because there are- uh, We could certainly let Redwood City know. I think that, Cheryl, do you want to, Say something about Sonoma State because no, I had mentioned that um, I had mentioned to them that we would take a break now, or it sounded like you wanted to take a break now. So, I, but, but we can yeah. do either way. If we can take a break now, I think we'd probably all enjoy that, right? Okay, why don't we do that? Okay, what do we need, folks? Five, ten? What are you feeling? All right, I see it in jazz. Right. Let's take five. Okay, we'll see you all in five minutes. All right. Looks like we're just about back, everybody. So if you can. Rather than calling roll, if you just can't have your camera on, just so we know that you're there, uh, we, that we can then proceed. It looks like we do have a quorum. Good. All right, thank you for coming back on time. We'd like to reconvene the January 28th, 2021 meeting of the Committee on Accreditation. And we're gonna to proceed to item 12. Item 12 is a report of the accreditation team to Sonoma State University. Administrator Cheryl Hickey will introduce this item. Joining her is team lead, Dr. Christine Zeppos and institutional representatives, Dr. Laura Alamillo, Dean, School of Education, Dr. Edward Lyon, Associate Professor and Director of Assessment and Accreditation for the School of Education, and Dr. Kristen Bolin, Assessment Analyst, School of Education. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Hickey, will you please begin? Certainly. I'm just, I'm trying to see if I can see everybody. Well, and while you're doing it, thank you very much, yeah. Senator State, for being patient as Great. we take a brief break. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so this is the accreditation um, site visit for Sonoma State University. I was the consultant on this visit. Um, it took place October 24th through the 28th, 2020. Um, I want to first start by thanking the institutional personnel, in particular, Kristen um, Bolin and Ed Lyon, um, working with them for, you know, about a year. I um, was able to, uh, fortunately, go personally to the year out visit and talk with them. Um, and, uh, you know, after uh, we turned to virtual, of course. Um, so I want to thank all of the work that the institution did um, to get this put together and got a chance to work again with um, our team lead, Christine Zeppos, always a fantastic team lead. So really honored to work with her. So when I first met with um, Sonoma State a year ago or a year from October, October of 2021, 
um, they, they, they had some challenges that they were concerned about. And one of the challenges was that they would have a brand new dean in both of the schools in which um, they, they have credential programs. Um, they did not know who that person would, was going to be or, and that person would be on um, only uh, for a couple of months before the site visit. So they had that concern. Plus the building that they're in, um, that the School of Education in was, was scheduled to be torn down or major reconstruction because of some asbestos issues. It was a beautiful building. Don't know what the state of the construction is at the moment, but um, so the School of Ed folks were gonna be scattered across the, the campus while that took place. And then of course, it, the visit was scheduled for October, which in Sonoma County is synonymous with fire season as it is in other parts of the, the state. Um, so they were working really hard to have um, plan B and plan C in case that, that took place. So we moved to the virtual preparation, uh, you know, after the, the state closed down in March. Um, and as we got closer to the visit, the um, staff at Sonoma State was repeatedly evacuated. So um, several of them had had issues as we prepared and got closer to the visit. Um, but really the preparation went on smooth, smoothly anyways. Um, so really to their credit that they kept working, um, you know, even, even with, with significant challenges. So when we got to the site visit um, on that Sunday, um, turned out to be a red flag warning for the entire state of California. Um, and in particular, that was a very scary thing for Sonoma and all of its personnel and its employers. Um, so Sunday was very challenging. Um, and I know Dr. Zeppos will talk a little bit more about it. Um, there was a, a lot of um, uh, people were um, engaged in other things because they had to take care of urgent business, um, you know, to deal with the red flag warnings and the warm weather and potential fires, um, both in Northern California and in Southern California. So we had team members that were also dealing with that as well. We had one team member who was going to be using one of her CSU campuses, their power went out and was gone. So we had power issues, we had internet issues, and we had um, red flag warnings. So it was very challenging. The, um, we were worried at the end of the day that on Sunday that we would have enough. Um, we had a lot of no-shows and the team, the team and the institution worked really, really hard in the next couple of days to really make sure that we had talked to everybody we needed to talk to um, by the end of the visit. So. Um, there were challenges on this visit um, that were beyond the control of the institution. Um, but I really thank the institution for their hard work in trying to get things together. Um, and I will turn it over to um, Dr. Zeppos to present the team report. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. And um, it really is. I've been on a, a lot of visits, and this is one that certainly experienced just about everything, not only the pandemic, fires, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, the evacuations, um, not only for the Sonoma State uh, folks, but also our team, um, which presented loss of power uh, to, to so many. And when you're relying on power to make the visit happen, uh, boy, we really, we really did not think we were going to be able to accomplish uh, what was done over that time. I think the only thing we didn't experience were earthquakes and floods. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> really happy we didn't hit all of the, the major uh, forces that could come our way. But a real testament, again, Cheryl's sage guidance and, and really, hey, how do we pull this together? Um, and the team, I have to compliment, you know, Marita Mahoney, Nancy Pergini, Robin Duncan, Terry Colpin, uh, Pam Lepage, and Christina Stephanie. Um, these are ones that said, hey, we'll do what it takes. We'll do calls um, and so forth to make sure we get the information uh, that's possible. But there cannot be enough stated uh, about the Sonoma State folks. And um, Dean Laura Alamillo, um, Ed Lyon, and Kristen Boland, and, and truly the rest of the institution. So talking with the president and the new Dean of Social Sciences, uh, there's, there's something highlighted with Sonoma State and in its relationships, the big R. And that is what um, not only made the visit go so smoothly with all that we, we faced, but really what makes the, the unit function um, and the university function in, in a way uh, that is achieving um, outcomes at, at the highest levels in so many different ways. And so um, I think you'll see that as you read through the report that the key uh, with those relationships and, and how the students are served uh, is really um, a, a strength of the institution. So looking at the standards, and I know you all read the report, so, uh, and, and, and we're a little bit behind, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase, but the, the program standards, um, and, and just going into this too, I, I wanna always, you know, kind of state the frame of mind. 
the team was concerned of, of a new dean coming in and the change of leadership and an interim provost. And there's always a slight concern too when PPS is outside of the School of Education and what's that relationship like and, and so forth. Uh, and through the interviews and through the conversations that each team member had, it was very clear that the unit head is Dean Alamio, that the resources and the allocations that the buck stops there and all of the support from the president and again, the provost and the, and the other Dean of Social Sciences, um, that, that connectivity really quelled all of the fears of there might not be as much consistency as needed to meet the standards at the highest level. So I thought that's just important to share because uh, again, those would be ones that um, typically would be problematic. Uh, but as we, again, went through all the program standards, uh, all of them were found to be fully met, uh, with the exception of the preliminary administrative services standards, too, as you read, um, which was met uh, with concerns. And so, again, um, to, to share the, the rationale of that. And uh, again, with the new dean coming in, we think a lot of these things are easily rectified, which also gets to our final recommendation in a minute. Um, but the evidence um, was limited in the shared responsibility between the faculty and the unit. Specifically, um, there's, you know, there's a po positive collegiality, but it wasn't seen how the programs within the department collaborate. And there was just inconsistent evidence um, that the faculty have collaboration with other faculty in the unit. So it was really close ties within each program area, maybe not as much formal communication with uh, those faculty outside the unit and those again in the PPS program, just again in a systematic way. Um, and the shared responsibility, um, for example, one of, the, one of the examples was shared responsibility in establishing systems for selection and evaluation of site mentors. Uh, so that was just one example of where there could be just stronger collaboration and formalizing um, that connectivity and discussions. The second area, all the common standards were, were fully met, um, except for standard four, which was highlighted, met with concerns. Um, and there, again, kind of tied with what I just said in the administrative program, there was ample evidence that credential programs were collecting, analyzing, and using data for improvement, program improvement. But there was inconsistent evidence that the unit regularly assesses their effectiveness in relationship to coursework, fieldwork, and clinical practice, and inconsistent evidence that the school unit uh, regularly analyzes and uses the candidate data and completer data, um, especially in admin services and uh, the PPS uh, school counseling. So thought those were areas that needed to be tightened up to show the consistency and the systematic processes to have that done regularly um, needed to be improved. Um, so one of the discussions, you know, do we have a seventh year report and so forth? The team talked uh, um, you know, a lot about this and didn't feel that these were areas that were not e easily shored up, uh, especially the dean was brand new a couple of months in. Um, we felt even probably by this time there would probably be progress in those areas. So um, the team unanimously um, decided uh, to recommend that the, um, the Sonoma State uh, unit gets full accreditation um, without any other types of reports that would be necessary. So uh, again, happy to answer questions after the unit gets a, a moment to, to share as well. So really enjoyed this, this visit, uh, despite all of those, those issues coming up. But again, um, I, I expect great uh, things to come from Sonoma State in, in the future. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zeppos, and thank you, Ms. Hickey. We now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment about their visit. We remind you it's not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you may have about the visit. Well, I think I'm going to be starting off. Um, thank you. I'm uh, Ed Lyon. I'm the School of Education's Director of Assessment and Accreditation. And just uh, really thank you to the whole site team visit, especially Cheryl and Christine for the support and constant communication, uh, CTC and the COA. Um, as, uh, as Cheryl and Christine said very clearly, yes, there was, it was daunting and there was definitely um, challenges, but the whole process was positive and extremely beneficial for our unit. And it, it really did provide a chance, the, the whole accreditation process to help us understand as a unit who we are, um, you know, what progress we've made in the last seven years. Oh, oh, unfortunately, Mr. Lyon, looks like it froze on. <laughs> Dr. Lyon, you there? There we go. Oh, did I freeze up again? Oh. There it is. There you are. Yeah, there you are. Okay, do I have to start over now? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
awesome. But it was it was re- it was extremely positive, and um, and again, we just wanted to, for in terms of an experience, um, just just thank the site team visit for uh, for the flexibility in in helping us uh, um, understand you know what we really need to do for a successful visit. So um, I wanted to share just a, a, a quick update um, sort of regarding the, the common standard area that was of concern uh, related to continuous improvement. Um, it wasn't surprising to us. It was something as we were going in thinking, yeah, you know, when we're reflecting on, um, you know, how we as a unit look at data um, and analyze and act upon it, um, we, you know, we, we have some, some work to do of, of, of coming together as a whole. We work very well as programs, um, but you know, we saw those inconsistencies such as was um, as said about evaluating our site mentors. We do it differently across the programs. Um, so one of the things that we actually started doing for even right before the site visit was, uh, was create kind of a unit wide um, uh, evaluation um, where our candidates would be evaluating their site placement, um, their site mentor, their university supervisor, their overall program experience, um, and all. And this would be given to all the candidates. So it would allow us as a unit to see, you know, what's going on as a whole, um, as well as our, our student services. Um, but then also be able to disaggregate, well, what's going on across programs or even specific populations of students. So we actually have this um, unit-wide evaluation that's under draft right now that we're going to start implementing at the end of the spring. Um, I think that will really remedy um, some of these concerns around thinking around as a unit, how do we evaluate mentors? Um, there's also were you know some uh, uh, questions about the inclusion of uh, PPS and admin. Um, we have a, a fantastic uh, committee on assessment. Um, it's called our assessment accreditation committee, which we have an, an admin credential representative. Um, and one of the things that we plan to do is also um, include PPS, even though we've had very strong collegiality, we didn't have a formal process yet for having them be on this committee. Um, so that's going to allow us to, as a, as a committee, to look again across um, the whole unit, um, what we were doing. Um, we do have uh, what's called a, a twice a year assessment colloquium. Um, and that is, is our chance as a unit to come together and uh, consider issues around, you know, what's our priority for um, what we need to be assessing and what we need to be acting upon. We are in a transition because we spent a lot of that time um, developing our vision for social justice. And I think we're, this process um, has really allowed us now to sort of move forward and to think, how do we use these spaces to then look more closely at unit-wide data and come up with systems for involving our stakeholders in decision-making not just for giving us sort of general advisory board feedback. So we're very conscientious um, about, you know, the areas where we need to go. I think we have a plan in place that, um, and systems to, to get there, even starting this year. Um, and, and we're just very um, hopeful for, for the future and the, the next um, iteration of, of accreditation. Thank you, Dr. Lane. It's nice to hear that you've offered some steps already uh, to address some of the concerns noted in the uh, team report. So thank you for your comments. Any other uh, member? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm Dean Alamillo, Laura Alamillo, and I am the um, the dean. <laughs> Started in July, so it was a very interesting way to start the uh, academic year. I have 16 years of experience in teacher education in the CSU system. I came from Fresno State, and so this idea of the unit lead was very much instilled in my in in me as I entered uh, my position at Sonoma State. I want to thank. Um, Dr. Zeppos and Cheryl Hickey and the entire team, the the way they approached this accreditation review was really um, built with like sympathy (laughs) for our context, empathy and a real caring approach. And I just I need to say that because it was very uh, stressful, not only for the entire team, but those who had to um, join us that day and that entire week. 
I really appreciate the thoughtfulness in how you approached it. Obviously, I want to thank, you know, Dr. Lyon and Kristen Bolin, um, President Sakaki and the Provost Moransky for their approach and advocacy for teacher education, um, educator preparation in Sonoma County. I am very much aware of the concerns that have come up, um, specifically in the ed admin um, assessment and inclusion of their voice within the School of Ed. What in my uh, brief time in the school, I have noticed that um, some of that inclusiveness needs to stem also from the department itself. And so I've been working with the chair on how to um, just learn more and be more inclusive of such a successful program. You know, I recently learned that all 16 candidates passed the first cycle of the Cal APA. And, um, you know, we have this, you know, one full-time tenure track faculty with her part-time faculty and two FERP faculty really leading this in our school. This is information that um, the chair can also take and share and just be more aware of the, the program itself. Um, I've been able to secure a mentor for the chair, um, an outside school mentor who can work on how to just build that collaborative nature within her department. She is a new chair and it doesn't mean that she's not a great leader. It just, it just lo really looking at how we provide support for these key leaders in the School of Education. You know, we are also looking at um, bringing in this this particular coordinator of the ed admin program into our kind of bigger decision making um, group, which is the Council of Chairs within the School of Education. So that might be another step in helping kind of, again, become more aware and inclusive of this um, really successful program in our school. Uh, I think, you know, it was highlighted in the report, but um, one of my first steps coming in was to establish the President's Commission on Teacher Education at Sonoma State. And President Sakaki and I have been, we've had one meeting so far where we have brought in district and regional superintendents and district leaders within this county to just kind of share in this planning of um, recruiting future educators for the region. And our next meeting will be in the spring. And it has really shown to be in that one meeting, um, very successful and we've, we've received really great feedback. And so those are just some um, areas that might address some concerns. But again, as we all know, in educator preparation, it's, it's constant reflection you know, constant looking at what we're doing. I work very closely with Dean Carlton from um, the School of Social Sciences. She's very much on board with um, building and um, strengthening that collaborative uh, interdisciplinary work be, uh, between both of our schools. We meet weekly, really. Um, and so I'm very much, uh, you know, aware of what's happening in counseling. That was something really different for me because counseling was in the School of Education at Fresno State. And so I I think for me, it's to just really build more of those um, kind of partnerships with the with School of Social Sciences so that we're able to just strengthen that, that um, relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alamillo. Um, stepping in mid COVID in July and also getting ready for the site visit was quite a task. So I can imagine you had your hands full. So thank you for sharing all the details that you did. Um, Ms. Bolin, any comments you wish to offer? Okay, seeing none, this is an opportunity for the committee members to offer any questions or comments that you may have for any member. And we'll start with uh, member Ford. All right, so mine is mostly a comment. I just wanna commend the um, folks at the institution and for your wonderful impact on your area, especially in these trying circumstances that were described just for the site visit. Um, I paid particular attention to the bilingual program because that's one of my areas of interest. And so I was particularly interested in your residency program and those kind of partnerships you're building. I think that can really help to inform the field. As you may know, at the February meeting of the CT of the commission, we'll be presenting the results of the bilingual work group that particularly focused on how can we improve the field work experiences for our bilingual teacher candidates. So I look forward to hearing more about that. 
um, you know, in my own world, professional world. Um, so congratulations on everything you've done since the review, as well as um, getting through the review in such a such challenging circumstances. And also just a shout out to the team for such a well-written, concise and very um, uh, comprehensive report um, that uh, took a lot of complexity and made it readable. And then also to you, Dr. Zeppos, for your comments that anticipated some of the questions I would have asked. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Just Great. appreciation. Thank you. Uh, Member Balotayo. Hi. Um, I think this might have been touched upon earlier, but I just wanted to be clear. Um, what systems will you put in place to systematically ensure that district employed supervisors are receiving their required hours of professional training that they need? Yeah, I can um, uh, respond to that. So we, we started a, a, a system um, you know, several years ago now, um, using the, the, the online modules um, through course networking. Um, and uh, we experienced a lot of challenges um, just from communication from mentors of, of just access to it. And, you know, with all of the other work that they need to do, um, we've, we, we had to have a process of streamlining. So we, we sort of now created, kind of try to do as, as easy as we can. Um, we call it kind of a checklist for mentors. Um, we kind of go through a webinar with them about what are all the different things you sort of already have done that have met the requirements for the 10 um, hours of training. Um, and then we have them document that um, and, and send it to us as long as um, information about where their credential area is. So we have sort of a database right now um, of the mentors um, with documentation that yes, in fact, they have met it. And if they have not, what we did is we say, we will then provide opportunities if needed, um, let you know about, you know, especially in this time right now, maybe webinars or things that were going on or things that we're doing at Sonoma State. Um, I know the Ed Specialist Program, as they're transitioning to their new standards, um, they're utilizing what we have been doing in single and multiple subject to, um, to follow kind of the same approach. So it's more kind of unit wide. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you both. Um, any other committee member have any comments or questions you wish to offer? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion from a committee member? Uh, Co-Chair Moore. My motion that we accept the report uh, and the recommendation of uh, accreditation. Thank you, is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amos. Cynthia. Joe Malin Bolatayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. And Cynthia? Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. So congratulations, and thank you so much for your work, Dr. Alamillo. Dr. Lyon, Ms. Boland, Dr. Zeppos, again, for being team lead, and thank you, Ms. Hickey, especially yeah. under those difficult circumstances in, in the, the fires. So I completely understand. I was evacuated myself down here in Southern and I, it's never easy. So I really respect the work that you did under dire circumstances. So again, well, congratulations. And Chris, thank Dr. You. Zeppos, you were looking out your window at the time at a fire as well, right? If I, I was, I and was. <laughs> well, thank you all, and congratulations, Sonoma State. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, we're going to move on to item 13. We are just a little bit behind, and we'll see if we can make up time. I don't want any committee member nor any institution to feel shortchanged at all. Um, but keeping in mind, we do have a number of time certains before lunch. Um, so we have time, 1030 time certain, which is item 13. It's the report of the accreditation team to Redwood City School District. Consultant Jake Schuler will introduce this item. And joining him is team lead Gail Calhoun. And institutional representatives, Aaron Kikos, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Uh, and induction director, and Michelle Griffith, Redwood City School District representative. Any committee member need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Mr. Shuler, will you please begin? 
Good morning. So um, the Redwood City School District site visit took place from November 16th through 18th, 2020. Uh, the visit was conducted entirely by video technology via Google Meet. A, a total of 103 interviews were conducted with various stakeholders throughout the visit. And despite being conducted entirely online, the site visit proceeded in accordance with all normal accreditation protocols. The team at Redwood City was led by outgoing induction director, Aaron Kakos, who is now the director of human resources for the, for the district. Also uh, current induction director, Michelle Griffith, as well as assistant superintendent, Wendy Kelly, who was helping lead the induction program when Aaron was out on maternity leave about a year ago. Um, so it was, it was quite the year of preparation. Aaron's family welcomed a new baby in late 2019, and then my family did in May of 2020. So we had a lot of babies showing up on our monthly um, Zoom calls at the beginning there. Um, uh, their, their team was fantastic to work with throughout the year and extremely thorough in their preparation. And their website was also very well organized and easy to navigate. Also joining by Zoom today is our team lead, Gail Calhoun. Um, this was Gail and I's second time working together and um, she's a joy to work with and a fantastic leader for this visit throughout the process. Also like to thank our site visit review team for contributing their time and expertise. I will now stop here and turn it over to Gail will present the findings and the accreditation recommendation. Good morning, everyone. I wanna thank the commission for the opportunity to serve as the team lead for the Redwood City teacher induction visit. I also really wanna thank Jake because um, he provided outstanding leadership as he has in the past, but he was also um, the person who brought virtual coherence to a virtual site visit. So thank you, Jake, for bringing that element. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank our hosts in Redwood City because they were so responsive um, and had such a commitment to making the experience positive and productive. So thank you very much. The Redwood City Teacher Induction Program is a clearly articulated and impactful program held in high regard by district leadership and the local educational community. Program integrity and efficacy has been maintained through several recent changes in leadership a testament to the district's commitment to induction and to new teacher support. Our site visit spanned one such transition as Jake mentioned, and the team was able to engage with the past and present induction directors, creating a full picture of how the program actively utilizes a continuous improvement cycle model. Virtual interview sessions were well attended and the site team collected a large volume of program data in a very short period of time. The site visit website was well curated and we were able to triangulate site visit data in a comprehensive manner. The site team found that all general preconditions and preconditions for all credential programs were met, all program standards for the teacher induction program were met, and all common standards were met. The unanimous recommendation is for accreditation based on this evidence. And while the team found all standards met, there were just a few areas that we suggest the program continue to strengthen. The team encourages the program to continue to evolve the ILP document so that it maintains its integrity and commitment to reflection and inquiry, but alleviates some of the rigidity of mandates outlined in the document. Additionally, the site visit team encourages the program directors to elevate the use of informal data in program guidance. While an extensive formal survey is conducted annually, stakeholders are not able to consistently apply that data to program improvement. And moreover, the formality of that data collection doesn't yet systematize formative feedback from stakeholders. The site team strongly encourages the current director in the collection of interview-based data as she described during our visit. It was just an absolute pleasure to work with Redwood City induction teachers and leaders because of their dedication to the profession, to equity, to students, and to improvement, and that was clear at every turn. I want to additionally celebrate their superintendent because of his knowledge and commitment to induction and comprehensive teacher support. That was really unique and special. 
Uh, I've been a little bit worried about the virtual site visit. And this was a wonderful process. And uh, I don't think that it was at all inhibited or impeded by the, the reliance on technology. It would have been nice to meet everyone face to face, but we did have a very um, meaningful visit over technology. So thank you everyone for making that possible. Thank you, Ms. Calhoun. Thank you also, Mr. Schuler. We now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you it's not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts you had about the visit itself. So I will begin. I'm Michelle Griffith. I am the new induction director that came on in a very exciting year. But um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to address the committee. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the incredible accreditation team, Gary, uh, Gail, Jessica, Kimberly, and Jake for their thoroughness, their clear communication, their honest feedback, and their supportive demeanor. Our visit ran like clockwork, even in having to do it all virtually. The visitation protocols, the interviews, the gathering of evidence, and our discussions provided our team with the opportunity to dig deep to highlight our strengths and identify our areas for growth. We definitely agree and appreciate the team's findings and recommendations. And we are, in order to address the two identified areas for improvement under Common Standard 1 and Common Standard 2, our induction board will be working in collaboration with our mentor team and candidates to determine how we can improve the ways we gather feedback what tools we should be using that will give us more timely feedback and a more streamlined process to review um, the feedback and make the improvements necessary to strengthen our program. We also in the process of including, we are in the process of including a more defined rubric that communicates clear, clearly performance competency in our program. And we're building those components into our ILP and reworking our ILP as well. I also wanted to, to take the time to recognize our school district board and our superintendent, as Gail mentioned, Dr. Baker, for their cons constant advocacy and support of our program. Their belief and dedication to the program is, a, is apparent in their continual financial commitment, their involvement in being on our induction board, and they are always eager and asking to hear about their candidates, their accomplishments, and their experiences. I feel our teachers are extremely fortunate to have their ongoing and unwavering support. And just one more point, due to our to, to the coordinated support of our district leadership, our dedicated mentors that continually work to strengthen their coaching relationships with their candidates, their focus on the cycle of inquiry, their, their, their guidance in the development of our candidates' ILPs, their lens of equity and their just-in-time coaching and our site administrator's guidance, our candidates are provided a strong platform to continue their growth as professionals and to teach equitably to remove the barriers that can exist for our underserved students so that all our students can achieve academically, socially, and emotionally. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. Um, any other member wish to make a comment, the institution? All right, seeing none. Any questions or comments from committee members? I don't see any. I'm just to address a comment you made, uh, Ms. Griffith. I, I appreciate the fact that you were saying that you um, were appreciative of the report because it enables you to be able to take that to the institution and use that for better support of your program. And we find that that's one of the most useful for, uh, of the process. So it's a long process. It's drawn out. It's very detail oriented, but it's, it's nice to hear that the result of the process itself is having some benefits directly for your institution. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. All right, this is an action item. Is there a motion? Uh, Member Balatayo. Um, I move that we accept the report and the recommendation of accreditation. Okay, uh, so moved. Is there a second? Second by Member Forbes. Any further discussions? All right, Secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Amos. Aye. Romelene Bolateo. 
Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Gary's. Congratulations for all your hard work. It's paid off. Thank you so very much. Absolutely. So thank you very much for your attendance today. We want to appreciate Ms. Kekos, Ms. Griffith, uh, Ms. Calhoun, and also uh, Mr. Schuler. Thanks for joining us. All right. Have a good day. Uh, let's move on to item 14. Item 14 is a report of the quarterly report for Aspire Berkeley Maynard. Consultant Miranda Gutierrez will introduce this item. And joining her is Institutional Representative Ruth Nagash, Director of New Teacher Development. Does anyone need to recuse himself? Seeing none, Ms. Gutierrez, will you please begin? Good morning and thank you. So this is the second quarterly report for Aspire Berkeley Maynard, uh, also referenced as Aspire throughout the report. The site visit was held in April, 2020 and at the June COA meeting, the COA accepted the team's recommendation of accreditation with major stipulations. Part of those stipulations include quarterly reports. And as a reminder, the first quarterly report was presented in October. Um, a second report is presented today a third report will be submitted by April 9th, which will provide an update on the actions between now and then. And then Aspire will host their revisit in April on the 20th and 21st. So I mentioned the first report was presented at the October meeting. And in that report, um, Aspire provided an outline of their plan to address each stipulation. And in some instances, they had already updated on progress and actions that had already taken place. Um, as an update in this report, um, they will pro provide additional updates on the actions taken si since October um, when the plan was first presented to you. And we do have the Director of New Teacher Development who will uh, provide more information about the report and the actions taken. So I can go ahead and transfer it over to Ruth now. Thank you, Miranda. Good morning, all. So really excited to be here and talk a little bit more about the progress that we've made since quarter one. We're really excited to continue the work to strengthen our program and our organizational structures. Um, so this quarter, we really focused on the support and development of teachers and mentors with our partnerships with uh, TNTP and also strengthening our partnerships within our organizations with our inner internal ed team and working together to create professional development that really supported not only our teachers, but also our mentors. Um, so we've been really intentional within this last quarter, too, to think about what kind of data we're gathering for a continuous improvement plan, but also not just looking at the data, but thinking about how we're going to analyze and um, gather feedback from various stakeholders. So um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've been doing a lot of uh, data gathering from our mentors and our participating teachers. And we'll be presenting that data um, in our advisory committee in two weeks, and then also in our organizational step back. So really thinking about um, what data is coming out of our program and also analyzing and getting feedback from leaders of our organization. So um, in our quarter three report, we hope to have uh, much of those next steps included. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gosh, for the update. Thank you. Um, any Thank you. Anybody ever have any questions or comments that you wish to offer? Uh, Co-chair Moore. I just wanted to um, say thank you for uh, your continued work and efforts to improve and grow and strengthen your program and be there for both the teachers and the mentors. Um, the, the sense that I'm getting is, is you know, that just a lot of caring and a lot of effort and very difficult to create those relationships on the Zoom that you're trying to establish yeah. and provide that deep um, professional development. Um, but it sounds like, you know, you're doing it, you're making the effort and um, you're to be commended for that. And we just thank you and we really look forward. I look forward to um, hearing what that data reveals and what, how that's gonna drive the next discussion and changes in your program. Me too, thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other committee member? Okay, seeing none, this is an information or it could be an action item. However, action really is not required at this point. 
Um, we could vote to accept their quarterly report for Aspire Berkeley Maynard, which would be useful if we would like to do that. Um, again, it's information only, but I think maybe for the record, we can go ahead and uh, accept the report if there is a motion to do so. So would anybody like to make a motion? A member Forbes. I move we accept the quarterly report of um, Aspire. All right, thank you. And I saw a second from uh, Member Hillis. Will the secretary please call the vote? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joe Malian Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Creation. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. Motion, Motion carries. Um, congratulations on the work that's being done. We appreciate that we're seeing some some progress being made in, in a very supportive environment and willfulness to do so. So thank you again. Congratulations, Mr. Gosh. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Gutierrez as well. All right, moving on. We are right on schedule now. Back on schedule to item 15. Item 15 is the report of the accreditation team to Manteca Unified School District. Consultant Bob Locks will introduce this item. And joining him today is team lead Lori Vasari and institutional representatives Eric Peters, teacher induction coordinator, and Kendra Martinson, teacher induction coordinator as well. Does anyone need to recuse himself? Mr. Locks, will you please begin? Okay, thank you. Uh, on November 16th to 18th, Manteca Unified School District held their virtual accreditation site visit. The visit went smoothly, which is a testament to the work of induction manager Eric Peters and Kendra Martinson. The team felt that we had an accurate understanding of their induction program and, when, and were very impressed with the tenacity that we heard of, of uh, Mr. Peters last summer when he had to fight to keep their induction program alive during stringent budget cuts. And I will now have team lead uh, Lori Masari give the results and recommendation of our site visit. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I would just like to echo uh, what Bob had to say about the team and uh, Eric and Kendra for your professionalism and all of your hard work in preparing for the site visit. Um, and Bob, I'd like to also thank you for your leadership um, and our, our colleagues on our team, uh, Latasha Porter and Pat Marrakesh. Um, <clears throat> in looking back on my notes on the site visit, I think I just really wanted to, to commend uh, Eric and Kendra once again on um, just this program being so highly regarded across the district among all stakeholders and just so beautifully integrated within the whole entire district community. Um, so while you were, you're meeting your standards at the highest level, um, you're, you're not elbowing or your way around or over inserting yourself within the larger community. And while nobody can imagine uh, working there without you and your department and your program, um, you do so in such a way that I think uh, most people have no idea the high level of work that you are doing in the many layers. But your teachers do recognize it and uh, they love the program. They love their mentors who are based with them at their school site and uh, selected by their site administrators. So you have that little piece of integra integration there that I think really supports um, everybody being on board for the teachers and just their ability to speak to their own growth um, as, as it pertains to their individual learning plan and the California standards for the teaching profession. So with that, the decision pertaining to the accreditation recommend, recommendation of accreditation for the institution was based on the following. The preconditions, all preconditions have been determined to be aligned. The program standards, all program standards were met. The common standards, all common standards were met. And so therefore the overall recommendation based on the fact that the team found that all standards for the teacher induction program were met and that all common standards were met, the team recommends accreditation. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Missouri, and thank you, Mr. Lux. We now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. 
We remind you that it's not a time to dispute, dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you may have about the visit itself. Uh, yes, I'm Eric Peters, and I'd be happy to. Uh, I really wanted to comment and kind of second everything that Lori and Bob said about just our interaction um, on both sides. I was very happy to, um, you know, start getting involved with Lori and Bob because it was evident right away that, you know, we were speaking the same language and they were definitely able to um, ease our minds when it came to a lot of the processes that we may have been nervous about leading into the site visit. Um, I do really appreciate the process over the number of years, the three years that I've been working on towards it. It really helped me as well as Kendra um, really understand the standards better and the whole process of really what induction is meant to be. And, um, you know, also being able to, to pass that down to our teachers and our mentors so that there is a real strong understanding of the purposes of induction, um, the supports that our mentors are providing, and really the purposes for our candidates going through because um, we want them to understand the importance of it as well. So uh, it was really nice to work with, with Bob and Lori and the entire team. And um, the communication was, was, was great and anything that ever came up on either end, um, we were able to address really quickly and everything went smoothly. I, I just can't say enough about the process. And even though, uh, like I think has been said, it would have been nice to you know, see some of these people in person um, even with the virtual environment, things kind of went off without a hitch. So I was very pleased with the process and to the point where, you know, I I'm trying to become involved with it myself and, and you know, be a part of the team going out. So I, I just can't say enough about the process and how happy I was with, with how it turned out. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Ms. Martinson? I would just have to say I agree with um, Eric's comments. We moving into this and then finding out, you know, with the climate changing and having to do everything virtually at first, we were a little alarmed at how that might change things. But again, the whole team was so easy to work with, very supportive, um, very complimentary, which we appreciated, and um, really made this whole process feel like such an accomplishment. So um, it's something that I'm I'm fairly new to induction. I joined the team last year. And yes, it was a little bit questionable as to how our the fate of our program was going to move forward. But I think eventually everything uh, that the work that was done here and our the people within our own district saw the importance. But um, so it worked out to our benefit and very much uh, support from our administrators, our mentors, and uh, just the participants. And if they love us, we love them too. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, thank you. Um, any opportunity, oh, this is an opportunity for any questions or comments for any committee members? A member more. It was fun, uh, fun. It was really um, exciting to see Manteca on the agenda. If my memory serves me right, and Cheryl, maybe you can help me out. Um, Weren't they one of the very first induction programs to go through accreditation? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You might I have think so. You know? Yeah, um, I, I have good, good reason to believe that. And at that time, the program, as I recall, was very tight and was in very good shape. You had some very loving, wonderful people. And that seamless um, integration of the induction program within the community as I recall, the induction program was actually housed in that big building where all, all the whole district is. And you can see over the, um, you could just see everybody. So everybody's getting along talking. And uh, I'm really excited um, that you were able to save your program because this is a small program. And despite the size, every detail, every standard um, is addressed with integrity. And I just, it was exciting. Uh, the report was terrific and well done. Keep up the good work, fight for your program. Thank you, Co-Chair Moore. Um, any other committee members, any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion from a committee member?
I move to accept the reports. I uh, have accreditation. We have no records. Okay, so moved by Member Morrison. Is there a second? I can't hear you. Uh, Member Larson? What is the microphone? Can I hear you? Yes, yeah, somebody's mic. Oh, okay. Um, someone's microphone. Uh, where are you, Nadia? Cynthia. 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 There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, so it was moved by uh, Member Morrison and seconded by Member Larson. Um, any further discussion? The Secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almos? Aye. Joe Malene Balatayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Paul Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Hi. Motion carries. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peters, Ms. Martinson, Ms. Masari, uh, and Mr. Locks as well. Um, thank you so much for your efforts. We know this is not an easy task, and the fact that you stuck with it and you pursued it despite challenging budget cuts and everything else that's going on. So congratulations for a job well earned. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, moving on to item 16. We're actually a few minutes ahead. Do we have the team from Cal State LA ready? Yes, they're all here. Great, so item 16 is a report of accreditation team to California State University, Los Angeles. Consultant Miranda Gutierrez will introduce this item. Joining her is team lead, Dr. James Arrio and institutional representative, Dr. Cheryl Ney, Dean of the Charter School of Education. Dr. Diane Fotsi, Associate Dean of the Charter School of Education and Dr. Holly Benzies, faculty and accreditation team lead. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, Ms. Gutierrez, you please begin. Sure, thank you. So the Cal State LA site visit was conducted in November. The entire visit was virtual and it was conducted um, with all normal accreditation procedures. At the time, and maybe even up to date, this was the largest site visit conducted. It included 20 programs, 11 team members, and two consultants. So given the size, there were many technical logistics that were well-coordinated and allowed the team members to effectively conduct all their interviews with ease. Um, I wanna acknowledge Dr. Nay for her leadership through the process and Dr. Diane Fozzi and Dr. Menzies for their thorough coordination leading up to and especially during the visit with all the last minute requests for documentation and additional interviews. Um, also, she's not on camera, but I want to acknowledge Iori Osamwani. She was co-consultant um, with me on this visit, so I wanted to acknowledge and thank her for her partnership through the process. I'd also like to thank the site visit team members and our team lead, Dr. James Cirillo, who I will now turn it over to report to share the report of findings. Great. Thank you, Miranda. And uh, first of all, thanks to Miranda and Iori. They were wonderful. Uh, you're only as good as your CTC consultant on these visits, and they were great. Also, uh, huge thanks to the 10 other uh, team members. Uh, as Miranda said, 20 programs, a huge undertaking, and it was highly successful. We were thorough. Uh, we came up with valid results. The virtual aspect, uh, I've done a lot of these visits, both as a reviewer and as a faculty member and administrator at an IHG over the last 35 years. And I'm coming to enjoy the vir virtual visits. Uh, it's a policy issue, not germane to our discussion, but at some point I think there must be a discussion about whether or not virtual visits become the norm rather than the exception. And of course, thanks to our, our colleagues at Cal State LA. It, it, you're talking about hundreds of interviews, interviewees, uh, very complicated because of the number of programs. They handled it beautifully. Uh, all 11 of us had our own personal CSULA staff member, kind of like a tech concierge. To, to help us through the process, and there were no technical flaws at all. Okay, so getting right to it, uh, our unanimous recommendation was accreditation with a seventh year report. And before I get into more specifics, I, I do like to take a second to talk about some of the wonderful and good things that Cal State LA has accomplished. Uh, one of the tough parts about being a team lead is both when you're reporting out to the institution and when you're reporting to the COA, uh, so much of the discussion inevitably focuses on things that could go better, but there are some things that do need to be mentioned. Uh, Cal State LA's candidates are the face of the future of California. Many are the first in their families to graduate from college and the majority of their candidates are Latinx. Also, uh, the institution has managed to achieve a 
admirable level of cooperation and interaction with school districts, um, especially with LA Unified, where there are certainly challenges, and uniformly, unanimously, site administrators and district uh, people spoke about the very high quality of the candidates from Cal State LA they were hiring. Uh, finally, I want to talk about oh, the assessment program. Interesting thing here is how wonderfully integrated their unit and program continuous improvement model was integrated with the campus-wide assessment effort. Uh, sometimes in, in IHEs, they're going in separate directions, but here there was a good integration, and that was good to see. And finally, they do have to be committed for the scope of what they're trying to accomplish. Vital programs that many IHEs won't touch, they're dealing with, you're talking about orthopedically impaired, visually impaired, adaptive PE, uh, physical health impairments. So they're committed for, uh, committed for accepting the challenge of those programs. Okay, all preconditions met, all common standards met. Uh, program standard-wise, there are 291 standards spread across the 20 programs. Uh, one standard program standard was met, uh, part, uh, met with concerns, and two were not met. 288 were met. Okay, so we recommended a seventh-year report focusing on three areas. The first one had to do with the uh, training, orientation, evaluation, and recognition of district employed supervisors in the teacher induction and the visual in, visually impaired programs. Resources were in place, uh, initial contact was taking place, but beyond that there was there was could have been more accountability to making sure that each district employed supervisor uh, was getting exactly what they needed. And I mean, we have to be honest here, this is happening in the context of COVID-19. And uh, the good news is, is that the, the institution is implementing a dashboard computer-based system to be sure that all district employed supervisors across all 20 of their programs um, will in fact get all the training, orientation, evaluate, evaluation and recognition that they need. The second thing the seventh year report needs to look at has to do with the guidance and assistance in the visual impairment program. And this was happening for some candidates at a commendable level, it was happening for some candidates at an okay level, and it was happening for some candidates in a not so good level. And again, it was, it was a matter of personnel and policies were in place, but they were struggling with, with trying to make this happen within the environmental context they were dealing with. And finally, in the teacher induction program, the, the ILPs need to do a better job of defining uh, specific and measurable objectives. A lot of the ILPs had goals, but they were too vague and those need to be refined. And then finally, uh, it kind of relates to what we're talking about in the first item, the feedback to the mentors in the uh, teacher induction program, that could improve. Uh, it was happening in some cases, but otherwise it tended to be more haphazard. So that was our recommendation. It's accreditation with the seventh year report. And uh, I'll turn it back to uh, let the people from the institution speak. All right, thank you, Dr. Zareo. And thank you also, Ms. Gutierrez. This is now an opportunity for the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you this is not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you had about the visit itself. Hi, I'm Cheryl May, the Dean of the College. I really appreciate the opportunity to say a few words. I have only two points to make. My first one is on behalf of everyone in the college, we really wanna thank Dr. Zarillo and his team of 10 for their thoughtful and careful work, uh, especially under our pandemic conditions. So we're really very appreciative to the team uh, for their efforts. And then my second point to you is I want you to know that the act of continuous improvement is critically important to us as we work to fulfill our historic mission. Um, I have read that um, LA County is the poorest county in the state if you factor in housing. And that's mind blowing because we have Beverly Hills and Pacific Palisades, but over in our part of the county, the poverty rate is very high. So we are serving the underserved and we know that teachers, counselors, educational leaders are really a key to the success in community. So we need as a college to do the best we can uh, by our uh, candidates who come and are looking, who come from the local community and are looking to be prepared to go back to their local community. So please know that the the feedback and uh, of the team is critically important to us and we're on it. We want to get better. We want to do even better by the people we serve. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Nay. Encouraging. 
Thank you so much. Um, anybody else on the team wish to make a comment? Yes, I'm Diane Fozzi and I'm the Associate Dean and I wanted to add to the thanks and I especially wanted to thank Miranda and Eora who were so patient and uh, so organized in helping us shift from what was going to be a in-person visit to a, a virtual visit for 20 credential programs. And also for Jim, who was uh, uh, Dr. Zarillo, who was very calm, very detailed, very professional. This was actually my fifth um, CTC uh, accreditation accreditation visit. Um, and this is the first one that wasn't a joint accreditation. And I have to be honest, I really love the focus on the CTC um, uh, by itself. So that was really good. Um, the entire team was really fabulous. They were very patient with the virtual environment. Um, they were, um, you know, they had a lot of interviews to do. I think we did almost 600 interviews uh, during the time. They were very professional and that made it so easy to hear the feedback that they had for us and so much so that we've already made some uh, efforts in that vein. In December, we already hired a professional or a staff credential advisor who's going to be dedicated to the education education specialist uh, programs for group advising and for individual program planning and for being accessible to all of our ed specialists, including visual impairments, uh, five days a week. We keep uh, working on our dashboard that Jim mentioned, um, and we already are doing more virtual sessions with our district employed supervisors. There are so many of them, and we want to make sure that each one of them feels very strongly connected to us. And we've increased the uh, coordination time for our induction coordinator uh, to make sure that she has the time available uh, to dedicate to her district employee supervisors as well. So again, thank you to the whole team. Um, it was really, it was really a positive visit for us, and, and we appreciate their time that they gave to us. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fazi. So five visits. <laughs> I think that's a record. <laughs> that could very well be. Um, all right, anybody else from the uh, institution? I think we got everybody spoken for. All right, uh, any committee member, it's an opportunity for you to go ask any questions or make any comments. Looking through both screens, I don't see any. Oh, there's Coach Moore. I just wanted to um, commend the team. It With 560 interviews, so many programs, such a large coordination, um, Miranda, amazing job, uh, and I look forward to the seventh year report, and Iore, thank you so much. Um, you're new to this, and you, you got one of the biggest site visits ever, uh, so well done, and uh, Mr. Z uh, Dr. Zarillo, I mean, and, and Dr. Nay, your enthusiasm, it's amazing, it's contagious, I love it. Um, I, I'm sure you'll do great with your seventh year report, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Co-Chair Moore. Um, yes, Aaron Selvin. I just wanted to say something, and I think Cheryl would back me up on this as well. Obviously, we read a lot of COA reports. You, would do, you do as well. Um, and this was a huge report. Um, and I just want to commend Miranda and Iori, and I'm sure also Jim and the rest of the team, on putting together a really, really well-organized, clear report that also, and this is just a little plus from us internally, was like ADA compliant in terms of its formatting. And I mean, it was just, it was, a, it was very impressive on the first go around to get such a really great report. And it's, that's not an easy beat. So I just wanted to say thanks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, ditto. Thanks, sir. Um, anybody else wish to make a comment or question? Okay. Uh, yeah, just to uh, reiterate those comments, the, the report was uh, amazingly thorough. Uh, I wouldn't uh, expect anything less. From uh, Miranda, having worked with her and uh, my colleagues at CSULA, um, and um, appreciate the uh, the report given the complexity of the sheer number of programs um, and CSULA's commitment to its original mission of uh, um, serving the the population that it does uh, is is commendable. Thanks, Member Taylor. Um, anybody else have any comments you wish to offer? or questions to ask. All right, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion from the committee member? I move we accept the recommendation uh, of um, accreditation with a seventh year report. So moved by Member Taylor, is there a second? Second by Member Forbes. 
Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos? Aye. Jomaly Belisayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Anna Moore? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Kevin Taylor? Aye. Motion carries. So congratulations to the team from Cal State LA for a job well done. And we know it's always continuous work and continuous improvement. So we're looking for great things down the road. But you guys just ph phenomenal report. Thank you very much, Dr. Zarillo. Thank you, Miranda, for your work. Thank you, Iori, as well. Um, overall, just a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nay, Dr. Fazi, Dr. Benzies. Thank you so much. Go on, have a great day. We are a little bit ahead, and we know that Gay won't be able to join us until 11.30, so this may be a quick time to talk about our lunch break. Uh, we want to try to give at least a 45-minute lunch for everybody today. Looking at our agenda, we do have a 1 o'clock time certain, so when we are concluded with the 11.30 uh, report, which is item number 17, we can uh, either, depending on where we end, um, sure, well, but there's some things if we... Limit it to 45 minutes. Can we come back with some of the items in the back end of the agenda? Or would you recommend we do the full hour if we have it? Yeah, no, we could certainly, um, we could certainly do that. It's up to you. Um, but we could pull up the procedures, um, the COA procedures manual. We want to have a chance to talk to you guys about that. And I don't imagine that would take more than 20 minutes or so because we want to just get your preliminary feedback before we start start digging in and trying to update that document so that could we could pull that one up if you wanted to it's it's entirely up to you we'll do what you want to do okay i think that kind of makes sense and so i think once we finish with the item 17 we'll kind of see where we are time wise but that's certainly an option to bring that in mm -hmm. co-chair more would that work for you in the afternoon schedule yeah i think that's a good idea and if we want we can have just a, a couple minutes break while we're waiting for gay let's give her a little breather so maybe um Little break, come back at 1135. Sure. Um, how about five minutes since everybody's clock is slightly different? All right, so what well, we said five, does that work? All right, so we'll take five minutes. Thank you. Looks like everyone is making their way back. That's great. Thank you all for being back in time. And Gay, I get a chance to catch your breath. Are you with us? I'll just wait another minute or two for see that Gay has joined us. Gay says she's here, but uh, but we're not hearing her. There. Yet. All right, there she is. I see her. By the way, I think of all the, Jake's not with us any longer, but I think of all the the uh, photos that, that are posted on the, on the um, profile photos. Did you all see Jake Schuler's photo of him with That him? was really nice. Oh, that was so was cute. adorable. It was just such a nice photo. Right? <laughs> I, I was thinking about that myself, Bob. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one. There's Kay. I'm, yeah, I'm in the inner sanctum now. I'm among the holy, the holies, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you all for being back on time uh we're going to go ahead and reconvene the uh, january 28th 2021 meeting of the committee on accreditation uh we are now on to item 17 which is the report of the accreditation team to orange unified school district consultant gay roby will introduce this item joining her today is team lead debbie parker and institutional representatives lisa green the executive director of curriculum and instruction and Rayanne lopez little administrator of instructional mentoring and specialized programs. Does anyone need to recuse himself? Seeing none, Ms. Roby, you please begin. Thank you, my pleasure. The virtual site visit to Orange Unified School District to, took place on November the 16th and the 17th of 2020. The four member site visit team met via Zoom numerous times prior to the visit both to understand and review the program, but also to organize themselves and their reports, which resulted in a very well-informed and strongly prepared team going into the interviews. Orange Unified School District sponsors both a teacher and an administrator induction program. 
and interviews were held with a number of stakeholder groups involved in the two programs over the course of two days. There were no unusual circumstances occurring during the visit, and we were able to complete the visit at the end of business day, uh, at the close of business on Tuesday. So we had a two day visit. And for re the report of the site visit team, I would like to turn it over to our team lead, Debbie Parker for the team report. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Rayanne. Um, she did such a tremendous job preparing um, all of the documentation for us, uh, a great accreditation website, easy to navigate, answered all of our questions up to the last minute. Um, so we did come very well informed and very well prepared. And I'd also like to thank Gay for guiding us through that process and being available to us um, for all of our questions along the way. I had an amazing team, um, Shelly Groom, Juliana Sykes, and Gita Stowe who did that pre-work um, as Gay stated and having been a lead on many reviews, when the pre-work is done, it just makes things go so much more smoothly. Um, they conducted themselves in a very professional manner and I very much appreciated um, having such a strong team. Um, we conducted a thorough re review of institutional and programmatic information and materials available prior and, and during the accreditation site visit including interviews with candidates, program completers, program personnel, mentors, coaches, and other stakeholders. After a, a review of all evidence provided and interviews conducted, the team obtained sufficient and consistent information that led to a high degree of confidence that all program standards for both the teacher induction and clear administrative services credentialing programs were met for the common standards as well as the program standards. Therefore, the recommendation of the team is accreditation for the institution. And I'd like to take an opportunity just to highlight some of the information that was shared during the team's interviews um, with all of the stakeholders. It was very clear through our interviews that both induction programs are part of the district. Uh, they're viewed as an integral part of both recruitment, growth and retention of quality teachers and leaders. All of the stakeholders that we interviewed expressed that the program focus, uh, focuses on supporting teachers and administrators to meet district expectations while allowing them to set professional goals that align with their own identified needs in the CSCP and capsule. In Common Standard 1, one of the strengths we found is that the, in the institution values collaboration and works together to ensure that the induction programs are coordinated with the district vision and goals. District leadership, program leadership, teachers on special assignment, content specialists, and site administrators all work together to align and support the induction programs. The allocation of resources to support the induction team is a priority in the district and appropriate authority is given to the program coordinator to implement the program. There's regular communication between the program leadership and district leadership. It was evident that they collaborate together to ensure that district initiatives are supported by the program. In Common Standard 2, we found that the district had worked to, 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 excuse me, to diversify their leadership team and they strive to recruit diverse candidates to match the population of the students they serve. The district leadership values the induction program as a tool for recruitment and preparation of candidates in meeting the needs of diverse students. There are mul multiple systems in place established by the district and the program leadership to support candidates and mentors. There's extensive professional development provided by the district through, pro through the program and also beyond the program, coordinated and a coordinated effort to ensure that candidates are getting the support they need to meet their individual professional goals. The, the unique assignment of the assessor and assessor teams to support in the induction process also provides additional support to candidates to ensure they meet the competency and performance expectations. In Common Standard 3, we found the program leadership provided a clearly defined roadmap that outlines the responsibilities of candidates. Candidates appreciated the flexibility in the process that um, also helped guide them to be self, uh, uh, to self-select their areas of need. 
and mentors and coaches were highly valued and strategically matched with their candidates to ensure successful and productive relationships. We found program stakeholders spoke of the responsiveness of the program leadership to program participants and said that any suggestions or needs were addressed almost immediately and program leadership was highly accessible and available to assist. In response to individualized goals of candidates, the program provided opportunities to engage with a wide variety of expert resource personnel to provide that contextual response. In Common Standard 4, we found all stakeholder groups to report active participation in feedback activities. They expressed they felt their feedback was both valued and addressed. The Diverse Advisory Board is also actively involved in the decision-making process, analyzing data, making recommendations that the leadership team values. And then in Common Standard 5, Program Impact, we found that the candidates perceived the induction process allowed them to collaborate, providing opportunities for re reflection and growth. Um, workshops on equity, differentiation, and social emotional health supported growth in the candidate's perception of their professional practice. And the accreditation data system also shows that program completers have grown in their practice as a result of participating in the program. We feel the district fully transitioned to the new teacher induction standards um, and embraces the concepts of those standards through their mentoring, through their individualized experience, through the communication and collaboration that they have, as well as their individualized ILP and IIP process. The coaching um, was a strength in the program, as well as the assessor check and the professional development provided. So we, um, we enjoyed having this opportunity to collaborate with colleagues and to particip participate um, in reviewing such an exemplary program. Thank you, Ms. Parker, and thank you, Ms. Roby. Um, we now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you this is not a time to dispute the team report, but rather provide any thoughts that you had about the visit itself. Hi, this is Rayanne. I am the administrator who um, coordinates our induction programs here. I want to thank the commission for this opportunity to address you today. And I want to thank especially our fabulous CTC consultant, Gay Roby, and our team lead, Debbie Parker. Both of them were extremely transparent, extremely collaborative in guiding our institution through this visit. And that really fostered a shared sense of accountability throughout. So it is to be commended for. Ms. Little, you're freezing up a little bit here. Right. And we can't hear you any longer. Nope. You can try maybe turning off your video, see if that helps a little bit temporarily. And Lisa is also here if she might want to step in and make yeah, comments. Right. Yeah, Ms. Green, do you want to go ahead and step in at the meantime? Um, it looks like she's frozen. She I looks know. like she's. It could be something being maybe at the district office itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe oh, that's too bad. Well, they said Gabe was fabulous. I think we have to agree about that. So. <laughs> I'm going to check. They both. <laughs> That's all we need. <laughs> Did they drop they both, out? Yeah, they both dropped out. So I'm going to watch the attendees list if they come back in and I'll, I'll bring them back in to this okay. meeting. Probably what they're doing is shutting down or coming right back in. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, anybody have any questions? Any committee member at all for Ms. Parker? Or Ms. Roby? While we're waiting for the institution to While they're thinking, I might add that Orange Unified was uh, one of the first two district programs who came in with an administrator induction program. So they really helped um, become trailblazers for this it's a new program at a district level and have done a wonderful job in making sure that they, their practice aligns to the program standards. Excellent. Really good. This would be the time for a joke, but you know, it's, we're going to hold off on those. I'm not seeing them come back in. My apologies. There oh, you there go. you go. Excellent. 
it must be a system problem on our side because I noticed Lisa Green was kicked out as well. Yes. Yeah, uh, the same thing. So, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, yours is the only face I see, but I just wanted <laughs> to take a quick moment to uh, praise the process because it did give us opportunities over the multi-year course to examine different pieces of our program and our standards. Uh, we really were able to work on ensuring that everything we do aligns across our district. It also gave me many ample opportunities to coordinate with others in the broader induction community in my region, and that fostered improvements for our program. So I want to thank you all for your patience with the technology in this time, and thank you for the opportunity to go through such a reflective process of continuous improvement. No, no worries about the um, technology. You're very quick. Looks like you shifted locations and somehow you got back on and whatever you did, but thanks for doing that. I and went to the wired connection. So. Oh, got it. Oh, old mm -hmm. school. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. But thank you for your comments. It's nice to hear that um, you're being supported um, both within the district, but also from the work of the commission here. So um, thank you so much for those positive comments. Um, any questions or comments at all from the uh, members of the committee? Uh, Member Larson. Um, I just want to do express appreciation for um, this program providing the opportunity for um, teachers outside of the, the district um, to participate, um, the charter, the two charter schools and the private schools as well, um, giving those teachers the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to offer any comments or have any questions? Okay. Oh, member Balatayo. Oh, it was just a quick comment. Um, I want to commend the district for being described consistently as a cohesive unit, um, that your collection of feedback is systematic and built into the program. And there's a really um, big emphasis on continuous improvement. So that's really great to hear. Yeah, good observation. Thanks. Um, anybody else? All right, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion by a committee member? A member Forbes. Uh, I move that we accept the team report and the recommendation of accreditation for Orange Unified. Okay, thank you, and Member Hillis, would that be a second? Okay, second by Member Hillis. Any further discussion? All right, will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joe Malene Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krasia. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Anna Moore. I, I have a question. Um, did Was the motion for Anaheim? For Orange. It's for, uh, did she say Anna? It's for Orange Unified. Okay, just okay, just double checking. Okay. Thank you. Aye. <laughs> Gerard Morrison. Aye. Kevin Taylor. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Congratulations, Orange Unified. I want to thank you, Ms. Green, Ms. Little, uh, and overcoming all those you. technical words. <laughs> thank you. Terrible uh, timing, but thank you very much. No worries, and thank you, Ms. Parker, and again, Ms. Roby. Thank you for joining us. All right. All right. That concludes yep. our morning agenda topics. Uh, we were scheduled to come back at one o'clock. And uh, would forty-five minute lunch be acceptable to everybody? So we do a forty-five minute lunch, and maybe come back with item twenty. Get a chance to go over some of that discussion then before the one o'clock time certain. Okay. So if that works, and look at your clocks, forty-five minutes. All right. We'll now break for lunch. Thank you, folks. <laughs>